Hello Panther fans, welcome to Gloria Snyder Stadium here on the campus of Parish Episcopal School as we're set to bring you week two action between the Parish Panthers and the Bel Air Episcopal Knights. Before we get set to bring you the action here this evening in our home opener from Snyder Stadium, let's take a moment and review the highlights from last week's game in Alito.
Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Parish Panther Football. You are looking live at Gloria H. Snyder Stadium in Farmers Branch, Texas, as Game on Sports brings you live exclusive coverage of tonight's Parish Football Home Opener between the Episcopal School of Houston Knights and your Parish Panthers. Alongside Jim Dixon and our sideline reporter Spencer Pattison, this is Brian Shackelford welcoming you to tonight's broadcast at Snyder Stadium. And Jim, after a disappointing defeat on the road in Alito, the Panthers look to rebound from last week's season opening loss with a victory here in the home opener tonight at Snyder Stadium. The Panthers come into tonight's contest in unfamiliar territory, having lost their season opening game for the first time in six seasons. Now, Parrish must stand fast against an Episcopal School of Houston team that comes into Snyder Stadium tonight fresh off a resounding 44-21 victory over Livingston High School. The new Panther defense will be put to the test once again tonight as Bel Air Episcopal quarterback Carson Gordon is a true dual-threat quarterback that the Panther defense will have to shut down both through the air and on the ground. Yeah, the, the, the challenge for Parrish is they really need to disrupt their timing uh, of the Knights. They need to disrupt that offense. And to be honest with you, generally after a loss like they experienced at Alito, to come back home and look at film, I would almost think they're probably more encouraged. There was, there was, you know, aside from that first quarter, there was a couple of slip-ups, a couple of missed calls, bad calls that would have went the other way. Um, there was a lot of things uh, to, to – there's a lot of things to come out of that with that are positive. And one of the things not quite so positive this evening is Caleb Mitchell Irving has been ruled out tonight by the coaching staff having aggravated – the ankle that he injured in the scrimmage two weeks ago. And the defensive coordinator, Will Galusha, I spoke with him before the game. He felt that it was better for Caleb Mitchell Irving to rest this evening. And in his place, a brand-new student coming to Parrish this fall, junior Jonathan Major, will be starting in his place tonight at right defensive end. And, and like anything else, Brian, when, when an opportunity opens up, you you got to give these guys a chance to see what you get. And here's a kid that's uh, – as far as Parrish, is untested and unknown, and and hopefully they'll be pleasantly surprised. Indeed, and while we await the Panthers to come onto the field here this evening, let's let's take a look at what transpired last week as Livingston lost to this Bel Air Episcopal team 44-21. And while we have a moment, let's go down to the sideline and Spencer Patterson. Guys, it was a, a tough game last week, but there were a lot of learning points uh, that Daniel Novikov said to his team. Post-game, the, it was all about picking it up, focusing on the next week, and uh, you battle with the best, one of the best teams in Texas. You can play uh, with just about anybody. Guys? For the Alito Bearcats, the defending 5A Division I state champions, I mean, that's the largest classification in public school UIL play before moving to 6A, which is the top of the heap for Texas. And the Alito Bearcats last night, or last week rather, in that 50-35 to 35 win, they showed that they are the dynasty that can claim 11 state titles, that they the rust is not there following their championship season last December. Well, and, and I mean, they, they, they came in last season – uh, you know, picking up two losses early, that was kind of a wake-up call for them. And, I, I, you know, to come off that, hot, that, that win, now that they're, they're kind of going, okay, this isn't the Parrish of last year. My argument is I think Parrish is equal, equal to the stand. Um, you know, just a, 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 a play here, a missed play there, an opportunity that slipped through their hands, and, and I think it I think it'd be wonderful. Oh, you're correct. I mean, the opening play of that game, if, if uh, Caleb Mitchell Irving doesn't go down with the re-injury of the ankle on that opening play, he catches Ray Guillory in the backfield there for possibly a three-yard loss and at best maybe a one- to two-yard game, and that completely changes the tone of the first quarter last night in, or last week in Alito. Yeah, and there was other opportunities. Um, you know, for example, uh, Darby had a had a great a great quick strike catch on a slant, and I mean you can review it and look at it. I'm not on the field, but it didn't look like to me that uh, he was down by contact, and that would have been at the very least a large gain. Uh, same same thing in the third quarter. There was just opportunities and and. And those things will write themselves as the season plays out. And like 
like we talked about, I mean, a loss is a loss, but it doesn't it doesn't count against your conference. It doesn't impede you to do you know to 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 accomplish what you came out to accomplish, which is to win another state championship. Yeah, that is true. And last week, also a bright spot on the offensive side, Hutch Crow, opening his senior season with 13 catches for 182 yards and a touchdown. And we saw the defense with 10 new starters have a little bit of a rough going in the first quarter. But as the game went on, you could see that they were able to gel and form a little bit better as they held Alito to just one touchdown in the second half. And the highlight of that second half was Caleb Bowers with the 85-yard interception return for the final touchdown of the game. Yeah, and the, the defense in the second half was obviously a pleasant surprise. The thing with, to me was it seems like the offensive line hasn't missed a beat uh, from last season uh, with Sam Liu anchoring. Other guys are stepping up, and I saw great line play uh, out of Parrish on the offensive side of the ball last, uh, last week. Yeah, and that is true, Jim, and we look forward to seeing a much improved Panther team this week. I mean, Quite honestly, you had said it earlier here in our open gym, if they were playing any other team in the state, save a handful, I I think that they uh, hold themselves quite well. It's just unfortunate that their opening game of the season was the Alito Bearcats who hold the UIL record with 11 state championships. Well, and and you don't get to pick it. I mean, you're, you're, you're sitting there scheduling these things out two years in advance and then some, and, and, uh, you know, it's just kind of it's kind of the luck of the draw, and uh, and how it how it stacks up with your opponent. You might get somebody on a down year uh, w- with a new coach. It didn't work out that way, and you know it's it's certainly uh, certainly something to, to to grow from. Indeed, and the growing experience here tonight as we open the home schedule here at Snyder Stadium, we're ready to go down field down to the field for the coin toss with referee Stacy Ashby. We'll get you the captains right after the coin toss. While we have a moment, we'll introduce your referee crew this evening from the Texas Association of Sports Officials. Your referee this evening, Mr. Stacey Ashby. The umpire tonight, Mr. Randy Daniel. The head linesman, Steve Malusian. The line judge, Scott Fleming. The field judge, Key Say. The side judge, Mike Jenkins. And the back judge, Terry Staten. And now here's referee Stacey Ashby with tonight's coin toss. Panthers have won the toss. They've elected to defer to the, the second Panthers half. Win the toss. They elect to defer to the second half. And it appears Episcopal will receive to begin the game. The they have also chosen the football to defend Panthers the football defend captains the South end zone. for the Panthers this year. Number 85, Caleb Mitchell Irving. Number one, Hutch Crow. Number five, Maddox Reed. And number seven, Sawyer Anderson. Captains for Bel Air Episcopal. Number 14, Carson Gordon. Number two, Braylon Thompson. Number 10, Ty Blevins. And number 77, Cullen Witt. And now we'll move forward with the voice of Parish Panther football here at Snyder Stadium, Force Baldwin, and our opening ceremonies. Football fans, please rise to table and kindly remove your hats for our prayer given by Alina Williams, Midway Campus Chaplain. Almighty God, we give you thanks for the start of a new school year. We are grateful for recreation and friendly competition and for the lives and talents of all the students playing for Parish Episcopal School and for Episcopal High School tonight. As these athletes strive for victory, inspire them to wisely use their strengths and skills to do their part for their team with integrity and honor. We ask that you protect them from all injuries and guide them and all of us fans home safely tonight. In your holy name we pray, amen. And now please remain standing as we honor our brave servicemen and women throughout the world. And remember that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
The colors this evening are presented by members of the Parish of this will pack 59 Cub Scouts we below den. Benjamin Cox carrying the Pac-59 flag. Caden Flieger carrying the flag of the great state of Texas. And Sky Arpy Carterbra carrying the flag of the United States of America. Our national anthem this evening is performed by the United States Air Force Band. <laughs> to visit here on the blue turf this evening and your Panthers get ready to open the home schedule this is the 18th season of Parish Panther football our 18th home opener and the 16th home opener here tonight at Gloria Snyder Stadium and Jim it looks like a beautiful evening for football here on the first day of September the second of 10 games on the season for the Panthers a good crowd here filling in on the home side as well as a nice visiting group from Houston coming up to root on their Episcopal Knights. And we're set for some fantastic football here this evening at Snyder Stadium. Yeah, I, I, if I had to choose a seat, I'd take one on the Parish side because they, they, are, they are gazing into a setting sun over on the, uh, over on the Eagle sideline tonight. And the team's set to get out on the field as Parish will kick to begin the game. Dylan Sherman will tee the ball up as dropping deep for Episcopal, number one, Braden Thomas, Brandon Thomas, rather, and number 18, Garen Sampson. And while we have a moment, let's go down to Spencer Pattison for our game time kickoff conditions. Guys, it is a beautiful night for some Friday night football. 95 degrees, probably the coolest it's been all summer long. Yes, it's still summer, September 1st. I'm excited for it. These guys are excited for it guys and here we go dylan sherman puts his foot into the football deep into the end zone they'll let it go out the back of the end zone and we're underway here tonight at snyder stadium and jim as we have come to expect from dylan sherman the ball through the back of the end zone for a touchback to open the game well and and i like to i like to watch him uh, roll that thing back with a little english on it on the uh, on the one yard line but uh, we'll get to that point soon enough well i think the the strategy here in the opening uh, stages of the game here, you just uh, go ahead and kick it through the back of the end zone. I think maybe in the second half we'll see him pull out that pitching wedge and get a little draw on it. Think, think, he, can, think he can handle up on that? There we go. We'll start off first and 10 for the Episcopal Knights. They'll put the ball in play from their 25-yard line. Carson Gordon, the quarterback, he'll hand off to number one, Brandon Thomas. The running back transferred in from Houston Lamar last season, his first year in an Episcopal uniform. And he has first down yardage on the first play of scrimmage out to the 36-yard line. And yeah, and, and the defense, the defense really is called upon right now, really to disrupt the timing of 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 uh, Bel Air's Bel Air's offense. And, and Thomas on the swing pass on second down eludes three, four tackles in the backfield. And nice footwork there by Brandon Thomas. He turned a four-yard loss into a two-yard gain making the stop, number 44, Caleb Bowers for the Panthers. Yeah, good vision. He came back in behind his, uh, his, his wide block coming in, and that cleared, the, cleared that extra two yards for him. But, uh, but good vision and opportunity. They actually mark a gain of three on the play, and this is a much different look to the Episcopal offense for 
Episcopal School of Houston than we saw in last year's game as they did not have quite the running back threat that Brandon Thomas is. Now third, pardon me, second down and seven. The reverse to Thomas. And that is sniffed out well by the Panther defense, staying home to make his second tackle of the game, Caleb Bowers. The initial hit for the Panthers, number 33, Hurley Weicker, the Jack linebacker, and they limit Thomas to a gain of one. Yeah, and the defense wasn't fooled at all. They kind of read that thing off the snap, and uh, it got a good punch on the line, which opened things up. But to have that, to have good pursuit off that outside uh, backer edge is is uh, is uh, a, a great a great thing for them. And now here an opportunity to get a stop for the Panther defense. Third down and six at the Knights' 40-yard line. Two receivers to the top of the formation. Now Gordon reading the defense. He'll change the play. Clock moving down to 10-15, remaining in the opening quarter. He's going to go deep down the middle of the field and wide open all by himself, Garen Sampson. And he makes the catch at the Panther 35-yard line on third down and six. Episcopal School of Houston will convert. That's 25 yards and a first down for the Knights. Yeah, and as we were talking about, they got to disrupt their timing. They got to pressure him, and, and they, they kind of felt that pressure coming and called off on it. And now a fresh set of downs for the Knights, now in Panther territory at the Parish 35-yard line. The clock moving under 10 minutes remaining in our opening quarter. Gordon, play action. He's looking deep downfield, has plenty of time. Now he'll be chased out of the pocket to run. And he'll manage to gain about five yards to the 30-yard line, chased out of bounds on the play by the nose guard, Landry Settler. Yeah, a great vision out of the quarterback spot. Uh, just just worked his progressions, didn't see what he wanted, and ended up getting that five-yard gain out of nothing. They actually mark a gain of six to the Panther 29-yard line. And as you see there, right there, folks, the feet of the Episcopal Knights quarterback, Carson Gordon coming into play quickly. If he does not find what he wants through the air, he has no problem picking up yardage on the ground. They'll try to stop that here now on second down and four at the Panther 29. A full spread backfield tied in to the left of Gordon. Gordon will roll to his left, hit the out route, and that's over the head of his intended receiver, Logan Barty. The pass too high for Barty. The incomplete pass will bring up third down now for Episcopal. Yeah, Gordon never really got his hips turned into that. That's why that ball sailed on him. But he had an open man, and that drop, that drop covered that corner. That corner let that thing go a little bit, and uh, they got to tighten that up, or they're going to pick that to death on him. And now another critical third down on this drive for Episcopal School of Houston as they face third and four at the Panther 29-yard line. A tight set as Gordon back to throw. He's going to take off on the design quarterback draw. Can they get? No, he splits the two defenders still on his feet inside the 20. And then Gordon steps out of bounds at the 18-yard line. It looked like Caleb Bowers was going to take Gordon down at the at about the 28-yard line for only a three-yard gain, but he manages to slip right in between Bowers and Zach Shapiro for the first down. Yeah, Barrel, Bowers just really couldn't get in there to wrap him up, and a very elusive. But but the thing that uh, the thing that I gotta like if I'm UNLV is he feels pressure and he he gets away from it. And now first and ten at the 18-yard line, Thomas with the handoff, big running room to the far side. Penalty flag comes in as Thomas stretches the ball across the goal line for a touchdown. But the referee, Stacey Ashby, signaling that this play is going to come back. It looks like we may have a hold in the secondary against Bel Air Episcopal. And indeed, it is a hold against the Bel Air Episcopal Knights, and that will negate the touchdown run by Brandon Thomas. Yeah, not what you want to see because completely unnecessary. He was through the line, uh, just really running downhill into the goal line, and, and uh, just you know somebody somebody really kind of got away from their block and, and and showed their showed their hands and, and drew the flag. Yeah, exactly. It looked like when the flag came out of the official's pocket, Thomas was already past the spot where the foul occurred. So that'll be something for the Bel Air Knights Episcopal or the Bel Air Knights staff to work on. Is it's now first down and 15 at the Panther 24. They'll put three receivers to the bottom of the formation. Gordon fakes, he'll draw to Thomas. And the Panther defense right there to make the play. The big hit 
by Jonathan Major, the young man wearing number 59 tonight in Panther Red, taking the place of Caleb Mitchell Irving this evening, and he gets his first tackle for loss of the game, a loss of two. And you gotta like the, you know, just a lot of parish hats on the on the on the ball, just a uh, lot lot of pursuit and, and good quality uh, good quality play. The two yard loss following the holding penalty will set up second down and 17 now, as the clock moves under nine minutes to play in the opening quarter. No score here at Snyder Stadium. This is the opening drive of the game as Parrish won, and they deferred to the second half. This is the opening possession following the kickoff for Bel Air Episcopal. Once again, trips to the right side. And now a stoppage of play as Coach Steve Lease did not like what he saw. And the Bel Air Episcopal Knights will spend their first time out of the half with 8.27 to play in our opening quarter. Well, and Gordon's back there moving around in the uh, in, in the backfield and uh, getting getting additional instruction to receivers and backs and and uh, they're you know they're almost running it like a like a street game and uh, and, and you know just shows the athleticism that that you're gonna that you're gonna run into and you got to disrupt that. Well, it looks like the front seven for Parrish have made some adjustments here during this drive as they have been able to keep Thomas in check. And now it's just a question in these, what appear to be, I would say second and 17 is an obvious passing situation, but you never know as the Knights have run a couple of draws already in this drive. But now it looks like with Thomas bottled up, they're going to need to key on Gordon. And that was a question that I had for Coach Will Galusha before the game is, what is the plan to keep Carson Gordon from being a, a true dual threat quarterback? Last year, he was not quite as polished as a junior as he is this year as a senior. So. That task was easy last year, and that was contain him in the pocket and make him throw the football. This year, that may not be the solution in tonight's game. Well, it, it, you know, and you also had that additional that additional threat with with a quality running back, and you know, they 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 kind of got four legs on the table at this point. You have to be aware. The same formation as before the timeout. Three receivers to the bottom of the formation now in motion. Braylon Thompson to the top of your screen. On second down and 17 for the Knights. Gordon back to throw. He's going to look for Thompson on the near side, or pardon me, on the far sideline, and the catch is made. A lot of room there in front of number 20, Jackson Sanford, the cornerback. Or actually, uh, Sanford, the cornerback, in just enough to move the sticks. They needed 17. They got 17 in the length of the football. It's first down and goal for Episcopal School of Houston. Well, with that soft coverage, they're going to come underneath on you, and, and they're and they're going to make you pay. And you, we have a uh, we have a night player down. And a stoppage of time with 8:20 remaining in the first period or the first quarter here at Gloria Snyder Stadium. As an injured Bel Air Episcopal Knight on the turf. But it was interesting to see that play as they had brought Braylon Thompson in motion from. The, left, the right side of the formation in the trips is the slot up to the top. And then no one followed him down the sideline. He was basically standing by himself there on the sideline at the eight yard line to make an easy catch for a first down. Yeah, I mean, just no nowhere to be and get there. And there's there's a lot there's a lot of teams that can't even execute that. Right. And uh, and they're they're making they're making hay with that secondary on the short field in this defensive zone. But give Jackson Sanford credit as he was in position to keep Thompson from getting into the end zone as he was able to come up and make the play right when Thompson made the catch. So it may be kind of a here in the open for defensive coordinator Will Galusha and his staff. It may be kind of a bend but don't break mentality as you know they can pretty much have all the yards they want as long as they don't get on the scoreboard. Yeah, I mean last time I checked you don't you don't win and lose by offensive uh, offensive uh, statistics, right? Yeah. Offensive uh, rushing yards, and, and uh, so I mean, yeah, very true. It's it's keep them off the scoreboard, and uh, and, and good pursuit as you uh, as you addressed. I mean, they he was he was at least seven yards off the ball, and uh, and the fact that you know he was over there to make the stop or or, or get the receiver pushed out. And the injured Bel Air Episcopal not getting some assistance to the far sideline. As we're ready to resume play now, the clock moving with 8.19 and counting in this first quarter. The opening drive of the game for Bel Air Episcopal, and they have the ball first down and goal at the Parish seven-yard line. 
All three receivers move from the left to the right side of the formation as Gordon now will go back on the counter run, a designed run for Carson Gordon. And he's able to stretch out that six foot one body for another yard and a half. Stopped just shy of the five yard line. And several Panthers led uh, in on the tackle led by Hurley Weicker and Landry Sattler. They'll call it a game of two. Well, and you alluded to, to the way the, the, the defense has been playing uh, here early and, and these ends are not giving up contain. They are they're holding that ground and that and that narrows the field and, and forces Episcopal to, to uh and now a big play here, the snap over the head of Carson Gordon. They've got Thomas pinned way back in the backfield. Can they make the play? They do. And staying home to keep to keep Brandon Thomas in check, number four, D.C. Crane, until he gets help on the tackle from number 19, Jesse Richardson. And that's a loss back to the 14-yard line. An eight-yard loss for Bel Air Episcopal. Yeah, those, those risk cues in that container uh, are in that container. Instead, now it's third down and goal back at the 14-yard line. The snap loose again. Gordon all the way back. No, he was, he was down. He had a knee on the ground, but they're going to let the play run. Gordon loose at the 25, swiped at the 20, and now he's just going to go out of bounds at the 18-yard line and give up four yards on the play. But it looked to me, Jim, and Stacy Ashby appears to be pointing at the turf, the head referee, that right. he had a knee on the ground back at the 33-yard line. But, nope, they're going to give him the advance to the 18. Essentially, a lot is still a loss of four on the play as they'll bring in the field goal unit with 643 remaining in the first quarter. You know, and we're, we're they're still suffering suffering headaches from that injury. They're still having to sub out, and you got to find your number ones on. You got to find your number ones on uh, on special teams and resettle. And and uh, you know, you're not on all on all cylinders. Logan Phillips with the field goal attempt from 35 yards. And it's no good and wide left. The Parish defense stiffens and holds. And just as we talked about moments before, they got the ball all the way down to the seven-yard line. But the most important thing, the scoreboard under the word visitor still reads zero as Parrish will take over first down and ten. Well, you gotta you gotta work your plan. And if, if it comes down to giving up yards here and then letting your opponent make mistakes, then let them do it. Don't stop them. And two consecutive snaps over the head of the quarterback, Carson Gordon, just deadly there. As the kick was from the 18-yard line, but that should advance the ball to the 20. And I believe that's where the Panthers... Yeah, because we're playing under high school rules, so they don't get the ball at the spot where the, where the ball was spotted. It's at the line of scrimmage. But since the line of scrimmage was inside the 20-yard line, the ball will come out to the 20-yard line for the Panthers. The officials there trying to do the NFL spot and give the Panthers the ball at the 25, where holder Anthony Saragusa spotted the football for Phillips. Now first and 10 for Sawyer Anderson and crew. Anderson will throw on first down. The pass complete. And picking up right where he left off last week, number zero, Carson Darby. Now that's something we didn't see from the Panther offense last week as Carby, uh, Darby fumbles the football out of bounds, but he'll still get credit for eight yards on the play. Hey, he had three guys draped on him. Darby's a pleasant surprise. I mean, that kid, he he uh, he looks for, he almost looks for contact. He doesn't care. He runs his, runs good, clean routes. We talked about that last week. Uh, just an outstanding uh, addition. Yeah, Car Carson Darby not afraid to make contact with the defense. Second down and two for the Panthers. Maddox Reed gets his first handoff of the game, and he'll cut that back up inside his big right guard, Five Jacob McKinney, and gain two yards to move the sticks. First down and ten, Panthers. Sam Liu was out there uh, blo the blocking second level and, and laid somebody out about 20 yards out. Sticks move, a fresh set of downs for the Panthers. They continue first and 10 at the 30. Three receivers to the bottom of the screen as Sawyer will go deep downfield, looking for Hutch Crow, and he makes the catch. Crow behind three defenders, and he's got the ball all the way down to the Bel Air Episcopal 31-yard line. 
just fantastic timing between he and he and Anderson. It just 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 great play. Way to settle in behind coverage and just come in and and, uh, and pick that thing up. After the 49-yard pass play, first and ten, tip drill, and here's an interception that could be costly down the sideline. Oh, a great play there by Anderson. We've got a penalty flag down, but Anderson got just enough of number 22, Devontae Taylor, to knock his balance off. He goes out of bounds near midfield. And you really can't blame Sawyer Anderson for what's going to go down as an interception in his stat book. But let's see how the play comes out here. I believe both of these penalties were after the change of possession, but that's unfortunate where you see the ball tipped up in the air and it's going to cost Anderson his third pick of the year. Well, it goes back to kind of what happened last year. A lot of them were just not clean interceptions. It was right. it was timing, execution, a tip, a, a dribble, you know, what have you, and uh, and, and really not something that uh, that was contributing, uh, you know, contributed to by the quarterback. Yeah, not deliberately, not a you know definite. A defined interception. Yeah, a defined interception where it's purely the quarterback's fault. But it doesn't matter what they call it. You don't have the ball anymore. No, that is a true statement. Two flags here on the ground, and referee Stacy Ashby and his crew having a long discussion as they try to sort out these penalties. Not sure if this is two separate penalties or if two referees saw the same call, but here's Stacy Ashby with the call. We have two fouls on the play. After the interception, we have holding the third team. We also have a dead ball, unsportsmanlike conduct on the third team. We'll step off 10, then half the distance we go. And with the unsportsmanlike conduct being a personal foul, both of those penalties, Jim, will be enforced. So the bad news is it is going to go down as an interception for Sawyer Anderson and a turnover to Episcopal School of Houston. The good news is the consecutive penalties will put the ball After all the, the way back at the Knights' 13-yard line. Will be the Knights 13 and yard line. you want to see what their offense could do with their backside on the goal line, and and I, I, I don't think you play as loose in that situation. Uh, we'll see how things change here. Uh, if they still have the same yips as they did down here in the Parish red zone, a uh, snap over the head of Carson Gordon could be critical here as they're just outside the shadow of their own goalpost with 5.53 remaining here in the opening quarter. Oh, yeah, those miscues got to get in check. This is it, it's critical territory. So the opening possession for both teams, Bel Air Episcopal driving the ball down as far as the Parrish 7-yard line, and they end up missing a field goal off the foot of Logan Phillips. And now on the return drive, the Panthers – on the tip drill, interception, give up the ball back to Bel Air Episcopal, but a holding call followed by a personal foul on sportsmanlike conduct puts Bel Air in a deep hole, and they'll start this drive first down and 10 at their own 13-yard line. Just past the midway point of this opening quarter here on Game On Sports, the toss to the running back, Thomas. And Thomas gets a short game close to the 15-yard line. I'm not even sure if he made the 15, Jim. And at the bottom of the pile, the backup money linebacker, Jackson Sanford for Parrish. Yeah, and, and a, a change of pace for that for that uh, Eagle offense. Gordon's under center. And that's that's got to, again, uh, again, got to tie up the, uh, you know, got to tie up your offense, disrupt your timing. It's an adjustment that you're forced to make. And now this time, Carson Gordon back in the shotgun, trip formation to the right side of the offensive line on second down and seven. Gordon's going to roll with it. Big hole to run through. He's going to pull it down and run, get a block, 20-yard line, 25, 30. And Carson Gordon with just plenty of room to run all the way out to the 37-yard line where Kyle Hamburger and Guy Stern make the stop. But that's a gain of 24 yards and a first down for Bel Air Episcopal. Yeah, I mean, he, 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 we saw the lane he was running in. It's parallel to, to where, we're, where we're broadcasting from. He saw it. He opened it up, and and uh, and really, Parrish, Parrish, he was through the he was through the line and through the linebackers before they ever really knew what was going on. The ball now out at the Episcopal 37-yard line, a stoppage of time, as the head linesman will blow the play clock dead with 4:38 remaining in the first quarter. We'll check with our referee, Stacy Ashby. 
Well, first, I think we're going to have a discussion with head coach Dan Novikov down on the sideline. Oh, and now we're referring to the standby official. This must be some sort of an equipment question. I, yeah, I don't have a clue. Or no, that's Assistant Athletic Director Ahmad Ajami. He's calling somebody and my phone's not ringing, so right. I think we're good. That means we're not in trouble, yes. All right, and I believe what we've overheard uh, through the conversation is they, the clock now running with 4.37 to play in the first quarter. Gordon is going to hand off to Brandon Thomas, and Thomas on the stretch, on the dive play over Stand left guard. He'll have a short gain on the play to the 39-yard line. And if I overheard the conversation correctly, there is a uh, there was some sort of uh, comment about a laser pointer coming from one side of the stands or the other. I'm not sure, but definitely a laser pointer is not allowed inside. Snyder Stadium during a uh, competitive football game, or really at any any point. <laughs> no, no, not at all. But I, I, I'll tell you this much: Brandon Thomas is a kid. You got to get under his pads. And a big pass downfield, still on his feet, all the way down to the three-yard line. That's Logan Barty with the catch. The 6'3", 175-pound junior. It looked like it looked like to me, Jim, that ball was going to go over the head of both him and Kyle Hamburger. But instead, Barty catches up to it, makes the grab, and that's a 65-yard pass play that gives Episcopal first down and goal again. Yeah, he just, I mean, he had to just create a little bit of separation between he and Hamburger and get get his hands around it and uh, very effective. And the handoff to Brandon Thomas. He strolls into the end zone untouched for the first score of the game. A three-yard touchdown run for the Bel Air Episcopal Knights as Brandon Thomas on the die play over left tackle. We'll put the Knights on the board 6-0 with the extra point pending. And, you know, that is that, that's that quick strike offense that, uh, you know, that's going to expose a younger defense. And, and, you know, obviously that's what Parrish is putting up, and, and in particular without, uh, without Caleb Mitchell Irving there to kind of close down that one side. Logan Phillips now with the extra point attempt, Anthony Saragusa to hold. And the extra point is up and good. And ladies and gentlemen, your score with 334 remaining in our opening quarter here at Gloria Snyder Stadium. It's Bel Air Episcopal Night 7, your Parish Panthers 0. And it looked like Parish had everything in control until the big pass play. That was a 65 yard pass play from Carson Gordon to Logan Barty, Barty making the catch over Kyle Hamburger and setting up the three-yard touchdown run for Brandon Thomas. Yeah, and again, unable to really force Gordon to have to make a decision, disrupt his timing, and, and if that kid could stand back there flat-footed on you, he may pick you to death all night. Oh, that's true for just about any quarterback on a top team uh, in high school football. You just you can't afford to give the quarterback that kind of time in the pocket and keep him from throwing uh, accurate routes deep. And another announcement being made about the laser pointers. We're not sure whether that came from the home sideline or the visiting sideline but it was definitely brought to the official, or the attention of the officiating crew. And folks, if you're listening to us here in the stadium, uh, please do yourself a favor and put that laser pointer in your pocket because the next time they see it, you'll probably be escorted somewhere by the Farmer's Branch Police that you don't want to go. The kick by Logan Phillips, it's a short kick. This will be Maddox Reed from the 16 yard line. He'll follow Darby to the right hand side across the 20. And Reed going down at the 23-yard line with the tackle on special teams for Bel Air Episcopal number 23, Brooks Edwards, the junior backup linebacker. And it's another opportunity for Sawyer Anderson and company first and 10 after the Episcopal Knights cash in on the tip drill interception. Yeah, and, and that kick was really designed to do what it would what, what they what accomplished, and that's to force force Parrish to either roll the dice on getting a, getting a deep uh, a, a deep down. Or having to bring it out and, and hoping your your kick coverage can uh, can shop, stop you short of the 25. The zone read handoff to Maddox Reed on first and 10. Nice hole for Reed. Once again, following the block of his center, Nate Weber, 
And the right guard, Jacob Bacanio, he'll gain, we'll call it five and a half on the play to set up second down. And again, another another answer or another question answered. This offensive line is, I mean, they're they're gelled together. They're they're working well as a unit, and uh, and, and they're creating holes that, you know, pretty much the rest of the offense needs to catch up. Anderson, the play action on second down. He'll go down the far sideline. And the catch made by Hutch Crow. It looked like that was going to be an interception, and that may have been the problem as Braylon Thompson went for the pick instead of trying to take Crow down. And Crow somehow, I think he took it out of Thompson's hands. But an amazing play catch there by Hutch Crow moves the sticks first and ten. Well, Hutch Crow is at least a hand taller than that defender, and that's how he ended up with it. First and 10 Panthers, they'll continue with their own 41-yard line. Clock under two and a half to play in the first. The fake to Maddox Reed, Carson Darby. Oh, that ball just off his shoulder. It looked like Darby was trying to run before he made the catch. Yeah, just a little Uh, on the back shoulder. Yeah, an unfortunate mistake there by Darby to bring up second down. Yeah, Darby's wishing that he had that one back, Jim. It's now second down. And 10 for the Panthers at their own 41. Yeah, and they're going down to this trip's near side and see what they can open up. Free play for Anderson. He's looking for Braylon Fields. Fields thinks he drew a offensive pass or a defensive pass interference call, but it will be a free five yards for the Panthers. Yeah, and, and you're seeing on this on this trips, they're playing the outside outside slot, forcing him out of bounds. And, and, and you know, making him have to recover to even get back into play. The five-yard penalty will put the ball at the 46-yard line. We'll replay second down, second and five. Once again, trips to the left side of the formation at the bottom of your screen. Anderson, the zone read to Maddox Reed. And it looks like Maddox Reed is getting good chunks of yardage in the middle of that night's defense. He'll move the sticks again, first and ten. Ryan, I was just about to say that. It seems like to me that that's where you can start making hay and open this thing up, force those linebackers inside, and then see where your pass can catch up to that. Taylor Cesarski with the tackle for the Knights, and now we have the clock stopped with a minute 55 remaining. Well, you've got to give this officiating crew credit. Oh, they were checking to see whether or not it was a first down. The rest of the officiating crew had set it up for third down and inches. And now the referee, Stacey Ashby, comes in and makes the decision. It's first down, Panthers. Anderson from the Knights' 49-yard line. He'll scramble out of the pocket, throwing deep, looking for Crow wide open. Crow with the catch and down to the five-yard line. And that's what Hutch Crow can do for you right there. He did it three times last week against Toledo, and he does it again here tonight. First and goal, Parrish. Yeah, Crow, Crow went, on, went in on his cover, man, opened up that inside shoulder, and was able to pull that thing in and get that little bit of extra yardage after the catch. And now first and goal for the Panthers at the Knights' five-yard line. Two backs in the backfield. Anderson wants the corner route. And they were looking for Crow on the corner and playing that all the way it was the 6'1", 165-pound senior, Braylon Thompson. And that play right there is why he will be a Yale Yaley next year in blue and white in New Haven, Connecticut. A great play there on the fade in the deep corner. Yeah, he just set his feet, played wall, and uh, it just really you know, really kind of stifled the entire play from that, just off that, that front foot off the, off the snap. And following the incomplete pass, it's now trips to the top side on second and goal. Anderson looking to throw. He'll get flushed out of the pocket going in the back of the end zone. And Bryson Fields had a chance to catch that football but just couldn't quite find the handle. It brings up third down and goal. And I'm curious, Jim, there on the play call, when they were getting chunks of yardage, five, six yards at a time with Maddox Reed up the middle here at midfield, why not give Reed a shot right there on second and goal? Maybe because you're going to give it to him on third. I, th- I think that me, I think they were willing to take that pass. I think they're trying to open that open that middle up where they have a, a little bit better game. And now it is indeed. No, Anderson's going to keep it. Try to get inside the five and across the goal line. Waiting for a signal. The official was saying that he is late. his knee was down inside the one. 
the headlines man comes in and marks Sawyer Anderson down. So evidently Anderson's knee touching the ground before the ball breaks the plane of the goal. And obviously Novikov's going to go for it here on fourth and goal inside the one yard line. Yeah, and, and that's what we're talking about, Brian. Is just just you, you, you got to train. You have to train these secondaries to look for stuff, get them to open up. Just a, just one step gets you that gain. And now it's fourth down and goal inside the one yard line. The jumbo package for the Panthers. Snap to Anderson. He'll hand to Reed. Did Reed get in there? This is going to be a critical play either way. We'll wait for the official signal. No hands in the air as of yet. It looked from our vantage point that Reed was able to break the plane. But they're saying no, that the Knights defense held, and they'll take over first and ten inside their own one-yard line. And Novikov is furious with that call by the officials. Yeah, and, and unless Reed is Gumby. Uh, his hips were over the goal line. Yeah, well and over I don't, the goal line. And I don't know how uh, how the ball did not follow. Well, the ball, I mean, the ball could not be any closer to the goal line and still be in the field of play as it is right now. But that's where the officials mark it with 23 ticks remaining in the opening quarter. So I guess you have to give credit where credit is due. The Knights defense holds. And now we'll see if Parrish can stand firm with the Knights deep in the shadow of their own goal post. A jumbo set on first down as Carson Gordon sneaks out and just like that pops through across the 15 for a 16, 17 yard run. Yeah, Gordon, I mean Gordon just scraped the line, found that found that hole on the outside and, and took off. And uh he's still down. And Carson Gordon's slow to get up. The tackle made by the middle linebacker, Bowers. As Caleb Bowers gets another tackle in his stat sheet. But you were hoping that the Panthers could keep the Knights deep in their own territory. But instead, like as you said, Carson Gordon just scraping across that line looking for the tiniest hole to squeeze through, and he found one for a gain of 16. Yeah, he's. I mean, he's still rough getting up. And, uh, yeah, he'll they, have to go off for a play. Yeah, they'll take him. He has to heal him. They, they stopped the clock for him, so he'll have to come off for at least one play. And it looks like for a play, we'll get to see the backup quarterback, Tyler Bloomgren, the son of Rice head coach Mike Bloomgren, a junior here at Episcopal School of Houston. And it looks like they'll run the clock out. The clock now running following the injury timeout and a very smart decision here by head coach Steve Lease is he's going to let this quarter run out and get his player an extra two minutes with the quarter break of rest. And Coach Novikov is still still talking. Yeah, he, he is trying to get the headlinesman. He's talking to the right man in Stacey Ashby because if you're the head coach, that's the only person you should interact with. But he's pointing at the headlinesman trying to figure out how in the world Maddox Reed did not break the goal, the goal line plane. But uh, it's a mystery that will remain unsolved as we've reached the end of the first quarter of play here at Gloria Snyder Stadium. And folks, with the first 12 minutes in the books, your score in our home opener here at Snyder Stadium, Episcopal School of Houston Knights 7, your Parish Panthers 0. And Parish still with work to do here when we come back to open the second quarter. They still have the Episcopal Knights deep in their own territory at the 17-yard line. First down and 10, this would be a great time for Will Galusha's squad to come up and make a stop here and force a punt. Well, not just that. I mean, they're, they, they're prone to get uh, get turnovers, force fumbles. Um, you know, you saw, it, you saw it late in the Alito game. I mean, you, you have pick sixes. This defense, I, I don't want a game plan for a score from them, but you can get one from them. They did last week. The defense scored last week, and now Carson Fowler in the game, the backup running back as quarterback, and it's just a simple zone read fake, and he gets the ball out to the 33-yard line. He gains 16 yards with Carson Gordon on the sideline. And they'll keep Gordon on the sideline as Fowler effective at moving the ball first down and 10. Brandon Thomas in the backfield. They'll go in the hurry-up offense. Thomas with the handoff this time. He'll reverse field and get across the 35 to the 36-yard line where Caleb Bowers will stop him after a gain of four. 
you know, and obviously a look that Parrish is not really prepared for, um, you know, with, with this, you know, in effect, a wildcat package. Um, and, and they haven't really probably seen it in film, and, and uh, they have to adjust to it, un and unfortunately, on the fly. And now Carson Gordon back in the game after taking two plays off. And his Episcopal Knights offense faces second down and seven at their own 35. The handoff to Thomas straight ahead. And he'll gain another, we'll call it three yards on the play as Jesse Richardson will make the tackle for Parrish along with Ty Whitty. Yeah, Tom's, Thomas is, I mean, wonderful vision. And we have a Parrish player, uh, Sattler is down. Looks like a stinger. Uh, he's holding up his holding up his right arm or left arm rather, and, and uh, you know, sometimes yeah, sometimes you'll you'll get that you'll get that uh, deltoid nerve rolled up on that you, can't, you don't even know you have an arm. Right, it just goes completely numb. Yeah, it's just dreadful. As the clock stops with 10:47 remaining in the first half, as Landry Sattler shaking up on the play and he is definitely holding that left arm very gingerly. I think you're right, that could be a deltoid stinger. We'll hope that he can return to action quickly. As it looks like number 60, Austin McLean, the senior will come in and substitute Landry Sattler. Yeah, that's one of those things that's just kind of a, you know, kind of a bonus surprise and you just you know, you just don't even know what's going on, and, and all, all you know is you can't move. First down. And following the three-yard gain on second down, it's third down and four for the Episcopal Knights. At the home, first two games for this Parish defensive unit is the play of the senior Caleb Bowers at middle linebacker. Yeah, Bowers is outstanding. I, I, I got to say that uh, Jesse Richardson came in and, and, and was able to kind of force the issue and almost got a fingertip on the ball. If he's just a step faster, we're going to add a different story. And a penalty flag on the play. It appears to be a holding call against Bel Air Episcopal. But we'll check with our referee, Stacy Ashby. Blocked in the back. Coach Novikov will decline the penalty and force fourth down and three on the Episcopal Knights. Now they bring in the punt team with number 81, senior Matthew McGreevy. As Crow and Darby drop deep, but I would think in this field position and being only fourth and three, you've got to watch for the fake here, Jim. Uh, yeah, I, I, again, I, I don't know what to expect. And a very, very high punt by McGreevy. It takes a sideways roll back toward the Panther 40-yard line down there by Braylon Thompson. The ball down at the Panther 39-yard line. Yeah, if you're going to see those kind of punts, the, the, the fake is certainly uh, certainly one you want to put in your repertoire. Only 24-yard net on the punt, no return. And now Sawyer Anderson and company go back to work trailing by only seven. And you would like to think that after the first drive ends in an interception, and the second drive for the Panthers ends in a goal line stand on fourth down and goal at the one inch line that now this Panther offense is itching to get into the end zone here with 1020 to 10:23 to play in the half. Yeah, and they just have to really get going on on uh, on execution. A penalty flag in the backfield. Uh, two penalty flags on the play as Anderson completes his first pass of the year to number 17 Colgan Pettit. But I've got a feeling that's going to come back with a couple of different penalties here against the Panthers. Oh. Oh, so both personal fouls, both hands to the face, so they'll truly offset. And we'll just replay first and ten. Yeah, and, and unfortunately, uh, scrub a, a nice gain from Yeah, Pettit. that was a nice 12-yard gain there by Colgan Pettit on what would have been his first reception of the season. Instead, the clock moves with 10-15 to play before halftime. And we'll replay first and 10 Panthers at their own 39-yard line. Spread formation. 
And Sawyer Anderson will hand off to Maddox Reed. And another big chunk from Maddox Reed. Another six yard gain out to the, well, call it seven out to the 46 yard line making the stop number 88, Cullen Walton, for Episcopal. Yeah, and Reed is able to get loose. He comes up comes up with great vision, finds holes, and, uh, and just accelerates. Now second down and three Panthers. They'll give it right back to Maddox Reed. And he, it looks like he's got the first down. It also looked like number 16, Frank McCrory, had his face mask. But no flag on the play, but it looks like the officials will move the sticks. First down and 10 for Parrish. Yeah, he's just coming up to the reach is coming up to the line, using his vision, finding what's open and available, and then taking that. Uh, it's 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 very efficient running, good vision. From the 49-yard line, first and ten, Panthers. The shoulder fake by Anderson, going deep for a wide open throw. Ten, five, touchdown, Panthers. And somehow, I don't know how Hutch Crow does it, he just must be faster than he looks. But he gets behind these defensive units and was wide open for a 51-yard touchdown strike from Anderson. Brian, it's really kind of, he beats his man, he adjusts his speed. He settles these guys into a pace, gets, gets, in, front of, or, you know, gets in front of him or alongside and then accelerates, and that's how he's opening up. He's just winning. You know, it's a great theory. Uh, theory and method of, of receiving it, just win the last three steps. And Dylan Sherman with the extra point off the hold of Drew Burton. And folks, your new score with 9.22 remaining in the first half of play here at Gloria H. Snyder Stadium. It's your Parish Panthers 7, Episcopal School of Houston Knights 7. And that's what it must be, Jim, is that Hutch Crow just has a hidden sixth gear or the ability to just lull that defensive secondary to sleep and then a quick burst of speed, and he's back there all by himself. Yeah, I mean, and a lot of these kids, you get them out there and, and just they, they just run as fast as they can. And and I think what you're finding is, he, it, I think what you're finding is these guys have that that additional gear, or or they're or they're comfortable and quick at a, at a lower at a lower rate. Setting up to kick Dylan Sherman for the Panthers. It's now a tie game as the Panther defense has held strong, forced a punt. And Sawyer Anderson able to capitalize on a 51-yard bomb to a wide open, and I mean wide open, Hutch Crow. And that's the Yale commit Braylon Thompson that Crow beat for that 51-yard touchdown pass. Yeah, and the thing that's overlooked is, is Reed went up to the line and and uh, it picked up picked up an outside backer coming in, got down to tie up his legs, and it basically gave gave him a double leg, took him down, and, and the officials didn't see it. And the kick into the end zone. It'll be first and ten for Episcopal at the 25 yard line. And let's go down to the sideline with Spencer Patterson. Guys, last week, Hutch Crow had 182 yards and a touchdown against Alito. I talked to his wide receiver coach this week, Vincent Chase. And he said he puts the best playmakers in the best place to make plays. And you can see that from Hutch Crow. He's having a big day for himself. Guys. And now the defense going right back to work. And could this be a situation, Jim, where the Panthers have scored too quickly or will this defense bow their backs and hold this Knights offense to another punt? We'll find out with 9.22 to play in the half. First and 10 at the 25-yard line. Carson Gordon handing off to Braden Tom Brandon Thomas, rather. Thomas still on his feet, breaks a tackle to 30. Running room down the sideline. D.C. Crane with a play, and Bowers without a helmet. Comes in to make the tackle. Now he's going to get flagged for that. The old Jason wouldn't play, but we've also got a flag way back here at the 37-yard line that looks like it'll be holding. Looks like it'll be offsetting penalties. But shades of Jason Witten against the Philadelphia Eagles there is Caleb Bowers running downfield with no helmet to make the tackle. And he, and he, the worst was he, he got to he got to get a lecture when he got down to his helmet. Right. For, for all his hard work, he gets a lecture from the officials and has to go off for a play. Yeah, a new rule instituted in both UIL and TAPS. If the player's helmet comes off, he has to stop play. And you're basically playing the rest of that play with only 10 men effective. And even after that, 
The player has to come off of the field for one play due to That's losing the helmet. The personal foul will not count. Now, what was the flag back here? I guess they both referees got the same play on the personal foul. I, I don't, I don't know, but I, Gordon also was Gordon also ended up without a helmet. I, I didn't see what transpired, but uh, he ended up without a helmet at the end of that play as well. Um, Carson Gordon remaining in the game, however, as the personal foul on Caleb Bowers making the tackle without a helmet places the ball first and ten for Bel Air Episcopal at the Parish 16-yard line. Thomas once again with another handoff. And they're following the big guard and the tackle the Yale Lyons commit, Thomas. Billy Wheelis, as Brandon Thomas is running Tyree down inside down the 10 to the 9-yard uh, line. A gain of yard. 7. Down, yeah, it, Wheelis is really opening up that, uh, opening up the center part of that, and, and, and Parrish has to adjust to that and get that thing locked down, stay in those lanes. And now a bad snap. And the junior, Thomas, smartly falls on the football. The report recovered by be a loss of a yard Thomas. setting up second down. Actually, a loss of two. It'll be second, or pardon me, third down and five at the Panthers 12. Two yards so, Miss Cubes again. Panther fans. Just killing the Miller and Episcopal Knights in the red zone. Third down. Yeah, and what they're doing, I mean, the, the, it's it's time. It, the, it's, it's untimely. It's it's really it's really bad time. Anytime you're inside the 20 and you're putting the ball on the ground, you really got to readjust for that. And now a punch trip formation to the right side of the offensive formation on third and five at the Panther 12 yard line. Carson Gordon with the signals. He's looking for Thomas in the flat. He's going to loft it up, and Thomas unable to make the catch. No penalty flag. No rule uncatchable ball. As you can see, the headline or the That's side judge quickly putting his hand over the top of his helmet, saying that ball was uncatchable. And it'll bring up fourth down, and we'll see the field goal unit again for Bel Air Episcopal. Yeah, I mean, even even though he's coming out of the, he's coming out of the backfield, he drew doubles. He still had to beat and turn up to catch that ball. I mean, obviously untouchable, uncatchable, because it was it was inside and, and, you know, well over his head. And now Anthony Saragusa will spot the ball. For Logan Phillips at the 18 yard line. Logan, will be a 28 yard field goal attempt for Episcopal. Snap back. And the 28 yard field goal is good. So three points on the board off this good. drive for the Episcopal School of Houston. Folks, your new score was 732 remaining left. before halftime. Half here at Gloria Tonight's H. Snyder Stadium. It's now Bel Air Episcopal Knights 10, Parrish Panthers 7. And another good job there by the defense to hold the Knights out of the end zone and only give up three points on that drive. And, and, the, and the Parish defense is playing, you know, with their backs to the wall, they're playing great defense. You just got to be able to extend that down the rest of the field. And, uh, and I think once you're playing a little bit more free, a lot, a lot better things happen. And awaiting the kick now by... Logan Phillips as he'll tee the ball up at the 40-yard line. Maddox Reed and Carson Darby dropping deep for the line, Parrish. 37, so Sawyer Anderson will be back on the job here on this drive, fresh off that 51-yard touchdown pass to Hutch Crow. Following the kick return here is now Phillips set to kick from the 40-yard line. It's a short pooch kick. And off a of bounce, this will be Maddox Reed from the 21-yard line. He finds a seam out across the 30. And the stop Five made on special teams at the 32-yard line. With the tackle on special teams for Episcopal, number 42, Josh Johnson, on the a junior backup defensive the lineman. And Brian, great, great defense or great uh, structure on that off or uh, on, on the kick team. They stayed in their lanes. And they created that opportunity, the and they're adjusting the for that pooch kick. Line. They're Pooch's adjusting for the style of kicks that they're getting, and and rather than uh, than hurriedly trying to make as much as you can out of it, they're they're staying in their lanes and they're very disciplined about it, and that benefited. Indeed, and as a result, now they start at the 32-yard line as opposed to the 25. First and 10, Parrish. Anderson, pump fake. He hits the screen to Reed. Reed with three blockers. He's got room midfield. And that right there, folks, is how you execute a screen. He, they were able to get three big offensive linemen out in front of Maddox Reed, and he gains 18 yards and a first down for the Panthers. And that was the only way you were going to bring him down is to come in from behind. 
You oh, we've got a flag over on the far side line, right, right, on the right on the edge of the play, right on the edge of the playing surface at the 40-yard line. I can't imagine it's an eligible receiver downfield because the ball was already in the air. Right. And it's holding against the Panthers. Ten yards from the spot of the foul. Still part foul. So one of the big three out there, we're not sure who it was, they didn't call a number. Guilty of a hold on the screen pass, and that will put the ball back at the 30-yard line. After the we'll replay first off, down, now first down and 12 for Parrish. Yard line. I'd, run it, I'd run it again. First down, Why not just 12. run it right back at him? Yeah, I mean, it, highly effective. It's showing, showing how, how you could go wide on him. Uh, that end's going to give you the contain. Cornerbacks are dropping into coverage. Spread formation on first and 10. Anderson to throw. And he'll hit the quick hitter, Carson Darby, That's with the catch out at the 34-yard line. A four-yard gain on the quick strike brings up second down and eight. Yeah, Darby's just not receiving opportunity. I mean, he's he's getting his catch, but he's got, he's got three or four guys on him. And now second and eight Panthers at their own 34, still in the base spread formation. Novikov now changing the play at the line of scrimmage. Play clock down to seven. Formation does not change. Anderson back to throw. Has a pocket. Looking for Darby downfield. And Darby makes the catch. And the penalty flag comes in late. The defensive back covering on the play. Number 22, Devontae Taylor, had a hold of Darby the whole time. And Darby still got behind him to make a big catch and draw the flag. Yeah, Darby had to kind of come back and, and work his hands free. To, to get that reception in, but uh, they you know they were draping him. And we'll see what the penalty call is. And it is defensive pass interference. And that will be declined. The Panthers will take the play instead. The ball now across midfield after the penalty is declined. A 34 yard pass play. 33 yard line. So now Anderson getting big chunks of yardage off the passing game. First and 10 Panthers, they now go to work at the Episcopal Knight, 32-yard line. And this is one of these series where things kind of start to open doing? up. We're moving the ball back five yards for some reason. Okay. We're moving the ball back five yards for some reason. Ball. Arbitrary. Uh, yeah, the catch was made at the 32-yard line, so we're at the 37, first down and 10 for the Panthers. Still in the spread formation, Maddox Reed to the left, Anderson. Looking to his right, he'll hit Hutch Crow. And Crow, with the short gainer, he'll gain four, four and a half, and another penalty flag. Crow laying on his back on the ground, and it appears that perhaps the Bel Air Episcopal Knights are starting to lose their composure here as we approach the midway point of this second quarter. Well, I mean, when you're having to back up five and seven yards at a whack, um, you know, you're going to get a little frustrated. Targeting the call against Bel Air Episcopal, so. Ooh, they've already declared targeting, and that is going to disqualify their sophomore star linebacker, Madden Morgan, from the remainder of this contest. So on review by the officials, they have already declared the targeting call, and Madden Morgan has been excused for the rest of the game. That will be a pivotal blow to this Episcopal Knight defense as we play, still have two and a half quarters of football left to play here at Snyder Stadium. I will say this, they decided it's targeting, and it's targeting, and it's done. <laughs> that was the quickest targeting ejection I've seen in three years. I agreed, and Steve Lease is out there <laughs> demanding an explanation. Doesn't seem to be upset, so evidently the explanation that he got from the officiating crew led by Stacy Ashby was sufficient. I think he just wanted to understand what happened, but I would suppose, Jim, because I agree with you, that is probably the quickest, the quickest ejection for targeting that I've seen in the last five years or since the targeting penalty has been put into force. But evidently, it must have been extremely blatant and very obvious as once they explained it to Bel Air head coach Steve, Steve Lease, he just nodded his head and walked back to the sideline. Hey, if it's, if it's not worth fighting over, it's not well, worth fighting over. Well, there Retreat. you have it. That 15-yard penalty will put the ball at the 18, just inside the 18-yard line. Or does it look like the 17? 
It is. The ball at the 17-yard line where it will be first down and 10, Panthers. So good to see that Hutch Pro is none the worse to wear for the targeting. Hit to the head. Anderson handing off to Maddox Reed. Bounces off Sam Liu. And struggling to get inside the 15, scrambling to strip the ball, number seven, Brady Reed, the senior linebacker for Bel Air Episcopal. But Reed still able to gain four yards on the play. And that's obviously something the Bel Air sideline has, has, has you know, you have to. They've seen that in have, film, yeah, haven't they? Yeah, well, I, I don't think that. I think I think it's just you have to steal a possession. So you got you got to get a strip. we got to get an interception. we got to force a fumble. They're pressing them on that. Anderson. Rolling out of the pocket on second down to his right. Throwing, oh, he threw an interception. Straight over the head of Colgan Pettit right to Braylon Thompson. And Thompson will take the ball all the way out to the 21-yard line, and that's a throw right there that Sawyer Anderson is going to want back as he overthrew Colgan Pettit for his second interception and the second turnover in the game for the Panthers. You know, and again, back to back to what Bel Air is trying to do. I mean, they really... They really have to. They feel like they have to steal a possession because they, you know, they felt the pressure on this one drive where Parrish is finally kind of clicking on all cylinders, and uh, and they feel like they feel like okay, now's the time we got We got to stop, and we have to steal that possession. And now the Panther defense will have to steal a possession of their own, as they as the Panthers are now down minus two in the turnover game here this evening. Knights football with 5.16 to play before halftime. Carson Gordon on first and 10, fakes the handoff, hits the swing route out to the far side. The catch made by number 18, Garen Simpson. And the slot receiver with the catch out across the 25 to the 27-yard line. We'll call it a gain of five. Or pardon me, 20, yeah, 27-yard line. Five-yard gain for Bel Air Episcopal. And, and again, Parrish's pursuit on the ball, they had – they had six, seven guys on the ball, and uh, and, and you know they're they they're, they're they're not done too worse for wear. They're not gassed, so the conditioning's paying off even on a hot night. On second and five now at the 27-yard line of the Knights. Two tight end formation for Carson Gordon. He'll hand he'll fake the handoff. No, it's a flea flicker play. Good coverage, but under, open underneath, and making the grab number nine Logan Barty. They had the receivers covered deep downfield, and then Barty comes underneath and makes a big pass play there. Yeah, Barty just kind of settled into that that second that second look where where that pocket was kind of opened up for him. Really, you know, no design play, just go find a go find an open spot, and it works for 30 yards and a first down for Bel Air Episcopal. They have a fresh set of downs now, first and 10 at the Panther 43-yard line. 420 remaining in the second quarter here at Snyder Stadium. Gordon will hand off to Brandon Thomas. Penalty flag comes in, and it looks like they'll have Tom, they'll have the offensive line on a hold, more than likely the backup right tackle, number 70, Alex Lozada. But that flag came out quickly, so it'll be first and 20 here in just a moment. And holding indeed the call against Alex Lozada and the Bel Air Episcopal Knights. First down and 20 coming up. Yeah, and, and they're, you know, again, again, you know, Dalliance is into the, uh, into the offensive zone, or into the, the Parish defensive zone, and then it comes right back, and, and uh, now they got to, now they got to build the, uh, now they got to build the wall again and uh, see what they could get accomplished. Clock winding down to four minutes remaining before halftime. As the Bel Air Episcopal Knights on the move with a three-point lead. However, they're back at first and 20 at their own 47-yard line. Spread formation as Gordon takes the snap. Dropping back in the pocket, going straight across the middle. And overthrew both receivers coming in on the skinny post. And D.C. Crane just barely missed his first pick of the year. Yeah, again, Crane has a great nose for the ball, but... You, you really, are, you know, the Parrish line is not really consistently forcing Gordon to, you know, to speed up, to, to chase no, he tempo. Has plenty to, of time. He, he has, he's doing what he wants to do on his pace, and they really got to pressure him and, uh, and change, his, change his rhythm. Second down and 20 now for Bel Air Episcopal. The ball remains at their own 47-yard line. 
They'll put a man in motion coming to the bottom of your screen. Number 24, Will Masterson, the tight end out in the slot. Gordon back to throw. They're going to set up their own screen with Thomas. He gets across midfield and gets back close to the original line of scrimmage. May have gained an extra yard or two on the play. And they will give him a gain of 12 down to the Parrish 41-yard line. It still sets up third and eight. Yeah, that the screen that screen kind of developed off of that flea well, flicker. These, these down linemen are, are now they're kind of the edgy. This they don't really know. They really don't know what's what's coming out of that out of that backfield. They can hit you with so many tools, and they got a lot of athletic kids in that backfield. And now a big play here for the Panther defense on third down and eight at the Parish 41-yard line as we approach three minutes to play before halftime slot and spread to the left. Gordon back to throw has all day long. He's going to take off. Puts a stiff arm on Bowers and has plenty of room to get the first down on a 13-yard gain to the Panther third. Nobody touched Carson Gordon on that 13-yard run. Yeah, I don't know that that Gordon even read progression. He just took off. I mean, he he just saw that that outside open up and and, and contained, broke down, and he felt like there was an opportunity and obviously took advantage of it. They'll mark him down at the 32-yard line, so just a gain of 11 on the play. But Carson Gordon managing to stop the clock with 2.54 remaining in the half. First down and 10, Bel Air Episcopal. The jumbo package in now, one receiver to each side. Slot receiver on the right. They'll hand off. No, it's another flea flicker as Carson Gordon. They find Barty again, but he makes that catch out of bounds. So they ran the exact same play. The Panthers covered the same two receivers. And as Logan Barty comes sweeping in underneath, he makes the catch, but as he slides out of bounds, bounds. incomplete pass, second down and 10. Yeah, and and the the line has to be cognizant of that. They think they they got a deep stop, and then then they have to adjust and then then put the pursuit back on as the ball then rolls six yards deeper. It appears that Episcopal and the offensive coordinator, Dan Casey, not afraid to go to the back of the playbook here in the first half of play. We've already seen two flea flickers, and who knows what else we might see here on second down and 10 at the Panther 32. Trips to the bottom as Gordon will look to throw. Now he's going to take off. Plenty of room to run as he comes to the near side. Stiff arm on Polka, and he'll just work his way out of bounds at the 29-yard line. And Gordon, I mean, it's just the speed and athleticism of a, of a young man like that. It just seems like he has the ability to go wherever he wants to on the football field, and he just steps out of bounds to save himself for the next play. I, I think he's capable of doing pretty much whatever he wants. He's just – the unfortunate side is Parrish is giving him room to do play. that. Uh, even, in, even in tight quarters, he's still very elusive. And, and you got, yeah, saw that on the goal line play. Yeah. He stuck through for a 16-yard game. Yeah, I mean, you've got to wrap him up. Third down and five now, a critical third and five for the Panthers at the Parish 27. Carson Gordon looking to throw. He's going to go deep in the corner for Thompson. That pass short and incomplete. Yeah, Gordon did, did, did not put enough mustard complete. on that throw. Just really didn't have his feet that settled right. And, 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 yeah, oh, sailed on him, uh, you know, he had the right line, just didn't get his feet settled. And we'll see if this is going to be, and it is indeed, Coach Lease will tell, call timeout. But 2.25 remaining in the first half. on the field called by the Knights. As Beller Episcopal will spend their second timeout, and they'll make a decision here on fourth down and five. Yeah, and I, I mean, the way this that thing's opening up in the middle, I think, you, I think you take that underneath. You, you go to your playbook and find something in that middle ground and, and, and t- try to exploit these Parrish linebackers. Um, you're, you're not really getting enough out there uh, with, with five and ten yards. Well, they only need five this time, so it'll be interesting to see what type of coverage. Now, the one thing that I've noticed that we saw a little bit more in the latter stages of the second quarter and throughout the second half of last week's game is Coach Belusia willing to take some risks on the blitz. Would this be a situation here where they may want to send one of the linebackers on the blitz and try, try to take Gordon down on the backfield? Yeah, I think with, with Parrish in, in this situation, the, the timing on it's right. They haven't seen it. They haven't seen a whole lot of it. And, uh, and, and Coach Galusha, you know, he uses that thing like like a, like a Stradivarius. I mean, it's very, very, it's very well-timed. 
and it's well done when it's accomplished. Indeed, as they were able to get a couple of sacks last week against the Bearcats. We'll see what the Panthers have in store now. The Knights break the hold. Critical fourth down and four. I'm going to call it fourth down and five, maybe a short five. At the Panther 32-yard line, Carson Gordon with the snap. He's going to roll to his right. The blitz comes, and they look on the near side, and wide open, nobody there to catch. Number eight, Carson Fowler. And he snuck Fowler. under the defensive coverage and has first down and 10. Well, they're going to call it first and goal at the nine-yard line. Stop. Yeah, it, uh, you know, wide open, nobody really on him. He's playing, he's playing in between those two seams. And, and the secondary really needs to kind of play it like a man. Uh, you know, rather than rather than le giving up these these large gains on this zone. And now the big package in the fumble by Gordon. He fumble recovers his own fumble, sticking 13. his hand in there to cause the fumble. That is the young man that is playing for Caleb Irving tonight, number fifty-nine, Jonathan Major. His first forced fumble of the year. Yeah, it, you know, good pursuit on the ball, but again, Episcopal inside the twenty, and they're just not as crisp as they need to be. And, uh, you know, if they could have taken advantage of everything they've had inside the 20, you know, we'd be looking at a totally different ball game and Paris should be forced to play catch up. And, and, uh, and they had the luxury of not having to do that right now. As it is second down and goal from the 12-yard line. Two receivers in the slot and two short in the tight end setup. They fake to the running back, Carson Gordon, going in the back of the end zone. No, he's going to pull it down. It looked like he threw the left his feet and threw the football, but Caleb Bowers prevented him from doing so. And as it is, Bowers, Bowers gets a sack back at the 15-yard line. Or no, they call it incomplete. He must have thrown it in the ground. They ruled him out of the pocket. Yeah. And now we have a stoppage of time. Yeah, that pressure on the end forced, you know, kind of forced them. But they're still not, I mean, they're pressuring him, you know, visually. They're not getting hands on him. They need to start, they need to start roughing him up. They need to get their hands on him. They need to, uh, they need to pressure him. And he needs to know that his timing's going to be disrupted. And so far, you know, he's, so far he's pretty much doing what he wants. And the first time out. The half by Parrish with 50 seconds remaining. While we have a moment, let's go down to the sideline with Spencer Patterson. Guys, if we take a uh, look back a few weeks ago, Dave Campbell was the Texas football uh, preseason offensive player and defensive player, offensive player. Parrish from the school's very own Square Anderson and the man who he just threw the interception to, uh, Braylon Thompson out of Belair Episcopal. Those two, that's the best you can get in all of private school football. We saw some great action. We're continuing to see it all night long, guys. Thank you, Spencer. And the officials have asked the clock to be reset to one minute, three seconds. As there was a evidently some miscommunication between what the back judge has on his watch and what we have here on the scoreboard at Snyder Stadium. We thought we were down to 50 seconds, but instead it's 63 seconds to play. But the one thing we do know for sure, Jim, it's third down and goal for Bel Air Episcopal at the Parish 15 yard line. Very true, and it's time for time for pressure. And they, you know, this that this the front three just really needs to get some punch and lift off the snap. Third and goal at the 15 yard line. Five receivers in the pattern for Carson Gordon. As all day to throw, throws underneath and behind the receiver Braylon Thompson. And once again, we've seen this in a couple of episodes here. Poor footwork on the part of Gordon. He didn't get his feet set and it brings on the field goal team on fourth and goal. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it, he just really kind of threw it into the ground, uh, you know, forcing Thompson. Yeah, Thompson's wide open in a, in a pocket in, in, that, in that secondary zone where he can accelerate. He's in the goal. He's in the end zone. Logan Phillips now with a 32-yard field goal attempt. The kick is away. And the field goal is good. Logan Phillips connects from 32 yards out, his second field goal of the evening. And, Jim, your new score with 55 ticks remaining here at Gloria Snyder Stadium. It's now Episcopal Knights of Houston, or Episcopal School of Houston Knights 13, Parish Episcopal 7. And that's now 10 points in this first half off of Parish miscues, specifically the two interceptions by Sawyer Anderson. Right, and, and again, not a common mistake. Uh, you know, 
for the most part, last season really didn't make those errors. And uh, yeah, and you and you're and you're looking at it, you're looking at it in this game, and unfortunately, you know the timing of it and the position of it is it, it just results in in uh, in just digging digging your hole deeper, and and this offense has really only kind of clicked on one. Uh, click consistently on one series. They need to get back to that. And now Logan Phillips set to kick for Bel Air Episcopal. He'll pooch this one up in the air. They'll leave it at the 30-yard line. That ball loose, still loose on the ground. And Carson Darby, of course, the man who comes up with the football. I think the mistake there on special teams, the man, the up back, should have backed it up a little bit and called for the fair catch there. But Carson Darby luckily comes in to rescue the Panthers. They'll have the ball first and ten. Yeah, I mean that thing popped about 15 feet in the air. It was up there for everybody, and 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 Reed took the punishment on it. They just they just laid the wood to him on the edge, and uh, and it, you know I, I I I'm hoping that that's a that's a reminder not to do that again. Indeed, and the one thing that we, you talked about it before, Jim, several times already in this game, Carson Darby not afraid to seek out contact as he sticks his head in there to secure possession for the Panthers. All right, kid's got a nose for the ball. Anderson to throw on first and 10 at the Panther 25, coming to the sideline. Hutch Crow with the catch, and he'll get out of bounds at the 38-yard line. A quick 13-yard gain. More importantly, they only take eight seconds off the clock and stop it with 43 ticks to play before halftime. First down, Parrish. Yeah, and Crow with great football IQ. You know, he, he knew, he knew you know, give up that extra yard and a half and get out of bounds. Situational awareness right there. A hallmark of the senior Hutch Crow. As the senior now gives the Panthers a first down. Anderson scrambling out of the pocket. He's going to pull it down and run. Down the far sideline trying to get the first down, and he does. Scampers out of bounds at midfield. He turned an almost sack into a 12-yard gain, and it's first and 10 Panthers at midfield. And that that's speed we haven't seen. Of uh, this season out of him. No, excellent acceleration there by Anderson on that scramble. And now the ball at the 49 yard line. Anderson and company still with 35 seconds to work with and two timeouts remaining in the half. So well, and, and, the possibility you know, to come away with points here before halftime. Yeah, and, and, and to Anderson's credit, I mean, these kids will do things in the offseason. That, that pay benefits in these early games, early months of the season, and obviously that's happening. Anderson to throw, and that was almost the third interception of the game for Sawyer Anderson. Looking for Hutch Crow, but he threw it inside Crow instead of to the outside, and almost picked off by Braylon Thompson, the pass incomplete. Yeah, they, they need to figure out how to structure these routes or execute these routes to hit guys on the run. And this, this obviously isn't the situation because you're going to give up yards to stop the clock. Second down and 10. A penalty flag, free play for Anderson. He wants it all. Another penalty flag. They're going to get the pass interference downfield. So not only did they get the free play on the offside, but it looks like Hutch Crow got him 15, drawing the pass interference call. Yeah, we've seen this several times in the short season, Brian, that, you know, they're almost initiating these these penalty calls, and that's a lot of you know that's just good offseason coaching. That's good coaching, uh, you know. Teach these guys how to draw those penalties, and and you know if when you can take advantage of it, they're going to give you 15 yards. Take it. And here's Stacy Ashby, the referee, with the penalty calls. They're going to call it defensive holding. So it will be 10 yards instead of 15. But either way, it is an automatic first down for the Panthers. And they have the ball now at the Bel Air Episcopal 41-yard line with 26 seconds remaining in the half, and they still have two timeouts in their pocket. Plenty of time here for Dan Novikov's offense. Well, and the other thing is you're keeping Bel Air's defense out there on these sustained drives, and you know, but it's going gonna, it's gonna to pay a toll at some point in the third and fourth quarter. First and 10 now for the Panthers at the Knights 41. Play clock down to eight as they're trying to get the right play in. The zone read to Maddox Reed. Reed breaks the tackle, 30, breaks outside to the 20, down inside the 10 and down to the seven yard line. They were not expecting the run there and it pays dividends. 
A 34-yard run, first down and goal, Parrish. Yeah, Regis came up, found his secondary block, went outside, found another 15 yards to, to get to that edge. And, uh, you know, and again, forces forces uh, Bel Air Episcopal to, you know, to, to reassess what they're doing defensively and get this thing back on track. They feel, you know, they feel that pressure of their backside on, on, the, on the goal line. And the Panthers will take their second timeout now with 18 seconds remaining in the first half. A smart play there. Great play call by Coach Novikov and the offensive staff. And an even better run by Maddox Reed. He breaks three tackles on that play to get the ball down to the six-yard line and set up first down and goal. So with 18 ticks remaining, first down and goal Parrish at the Bel Air Episcopal six-yard line. A chance to tie the game here with a score. And we'll reset the the play clock at 25 seconds. Two backs in the backfield now, first and goal. Maddox Reed with the carry. He's going to go straight ahead following Picano and Liu. Did he get in? He did not, so they'll quickly call timeout. But he gets down inside the one-yard line, and, Jim, we've already been here before in this game. This is second down and goal at the one, which normally wouldn't be an issue. But now you've only got 10 seconds to play in the half, and you're out of timeouts. Well, I, I think you go up, and you know what you're going to do. And, and, and I mean, I, if it was me, I'm, I'm, using, I'm utilizing everything inside the tackles. I'm going to punch them to the back of the end zone and, uh, and, and get in for pay dirt. Now, this could be a play here. Is this an opportunity where you kind of fake them out with, you know, make it look like a short play, and then you find the tight end kind of peeling out into the corner? Oh, there's all kinds of options, a bit, but, I mean, you you got to show – You've got to show that you're going to go up and, and, and smash mouth them. And whatever you set up on that outside, uh, you know, I, I think is going to open up for you. But you've got to be able to win the trench. Indeed. I think this might be an opportunity, just like you're saying, Jim, to just for a parish to just show Bel Air Episcopal that this is our line of scrimmage and we're going to push you three yards off the ball and get the score. Well, we'll find out here. Second down and goal inside the one-yard line. Anderson, he's going to look to throw, and he'll just – Oh, almost through the interception. He did not see number 88, Cullen Walton, down low on coverage. And that play, given the way that it it unfolded, Jim, that went about as good as it could for Parrish. It sets up third down and goal with six seconds remaining. Yeah, I mean, that it was ugly, but the outcome was exactly what you were hoping for. And we'll see what happens here now. Six ticks remaining before halftime. Third and goal, Panthers inside the one. Anderson, Reed, and Reed is going to be held out of the end zone, and the horn sounds bringing us to halftime. Cutting through to make the play, number 10, the middle linebacker Ty Blevins to keep the Panthers out of the end zone as the halftime buzzer sounds. 13-7, your score at the halftime break. Well, and and, and this – the first half for Bel Air went about as well as it could have gone. So you got to wonder, you know, that little boost of momentum going into halftime. I mean, and what are they, you know, what are they going to come out with? Because uh, because these kids are walking out of here high as a kite. And a 13-7 score here at the halftime break at Gloria Snyder Stadium. As we will take a moment here to analyze the first half of play and following a brief discussion here with the with the officials we're going to go live down to the field for a quick interview now let's go down to Spencer Pattison on the sideline with Bel Air Episcopal coach Steve Lease Coach, uh, a great finish to that second half. Two goal line stands uh, in in the first half. How do you feel about your team's performance so far? Right now, we got to finish, and our offense is driving the ball. We just got to put it in the end zone, and and we're, we're getting opportunities. But we got to finish. But our defense is stepping up and, and and carrying the half right now. What are you looking for in the second half from your guys to move the ball? 
and, and we can move the ball, and we're really special at it. We've done it all year. We need to keep doing it, just believe in what we're, we're doing and, ha- and just kind of loosen up a little bit. Carson Gordon has done a fantastic job leading your guys here in the first half. What can you tell me about him? This is what we were saying. Like, we, we go as far as he can take us. You know, he's just a tremendous leader, and I promise you he's the first one in the locker room right now getting everybody fired up. Thank you, Coach. Yeah, thank you. Guys. And that interview with Coach Steve Lease of the Bel Air Episcopal Knights here is the horn sounds bringing us to halftime. Ladies and gentlemen, we've reached the end of the first half of play here at Gloria H. Snyder Stadium in Farmers Branch, Texas. As Game On Sports Network brings you live exclusive coverage of the Parish Panther home opener in week two. And your score here at halftime, it's Bel Air Episcopal Knights 13, your Parish Panthers 7. And Jim, it's been, I mean, let's be honest about it, it's been a half, a first half that has had several minor mistakes. You've got mistakes on the Bel Air Episcopal side that Coach Lease just alluded to, the snaps over the head in the end zone, the inability to convert, which has forced them to take three field goal opportunities, converting two instead of, you know, four, possibly five touchdowns in the first half, and the miscues on the Parrish side, two interceptions by Sawyer Anderson that Bel Air Episcopal has turned into ten points here at the half. Well, if they were more disciplined, Inside the 30. Bel Air, uh, you're talking Yeah, Bel Air. We, we'd we be up here crying the blues right now. It would be a 35-7 to 7 yeah, game. Yeah, because honestly, uh, yo, if, they just, if they just did those little things right, now you wonder, is that is that yips, is that jitters, is that systemic? And, and you know, if you're on the Parrish sideline, you know, you're hoping you can take advantage of those misuse, force more, and, and force them to play on their heels. This isn't out of reach by either team. Oh, six-point game. Oh, yeah. And, and if you're going to tell me it, it, it's going to be a six-point game at the, in the fourth quarter, I don't, I don't think that's going to happen. But if you're Parrish, you want to you go in and recapture that momentum and be able to hold that thing and, and execute the way you want to. You really only have one drive uh, to speak of that you executed in a Parish Panther way. That is true, the 51-yard strike to Hutch Pro. Yeah, and, and uh, you know, you really want to be able to come back out in second half and execute uh, consistently, and and then and then the game the game's turned on its end. Well, now that we've talked about the mistakes made in the first half, let's give credit where credit is due and talk about this Parish Panther, Panther defense that has stiffened and limited and we have to say it limited the Bel Air Episcopal offense to only 13 points in this first half. It could easily be 28, possibly 35 points for the Knights at halftime. Yeah, and again, they've done a fantastic job in the first half. Sure, and and, and they're they're taking they're taking opportunity. They're they're playing very disciplined, very focused. They're staying in their lanes. They're doing the little things right. And uh, you know whether whether it's whether it's Bel Air Episcopal making mistakes or Parish. Uh, forcing them to make mistakes. Mistakes are being made, and you got to figure out how to continue that effort. And on the Bel Air Episcopal side, the, their defense has played very strong as well. Not only have they intercepted Sawyer Anderson twice and allowed their offense to turn that into 10 points on the scoreboard, but they have stopped the Parrish offense now twice inside the five-yard line in the first half. Yeah, and on that defense, uh, on the on the entire uh, Bel Air Episcopal squad, you know, you know, you look at you look at Dave Campbell, you look at wherever, and they got two athletes. I, I got news for you; they got more athletes over on over on their sideline than than a lot of teams that Parrish is going to face this year. And, uh, and and these kids are playing top level top level football. And uh, you know, you really have to have to figure out. Okay, we have to create space, take advantage of that, and and get downfield because if we're going to have to out, out athletic these kids off the line or in, or in close quarters, you know, we may come out on the short end of this thing. Indeed, and we'll see who can do a better job of making the halftime adjustments as we'll step aside for the halftime entertainment. Your score here at halftime at Parish Episcopal School, Episcopal School of Houston Knights 13, your Parish Panthers 7. Enjoy the halftime festivities, everyone, and we'll see you back here with the second half of tonight's exciting game right here on Game On Sports. Her captain, four-time All-American, Emma Dabney. And your captain, three-time All-American, Emma Michael. Thank you for having us, and let's hear it for the night.
Paris to Pittsville School, which is today's halftime sponsor and the doctor. Dr. Richard Rhodes, the Baylor Scott White Orthopedic Associates of Dallas, for his continued support and dedication to the Paris Athletic Program and its student athletes. We wish to also thank halftime sponsor Origin Bank, a proud supporter of Paris the Pittsville School. At Origin Bank, they know the importance of teamwork. They offer competitive rates, a variety of products, and they treat every customer like the only customer. Thank you, Origin Bank. And now to take you through the rest of the halftime activity, senior Carlos Pineda. Please welcome to the field your parent cheerleader. Your 2023-2024 varsity head captain is Polly Brown with co-captains Dave Palmer and Eleanor Patel. Now special captains are Laura Mangelsdorf and Natalie Rubin. The Paris cheer team is led by Coach Becca Johnson and Jamie Baldo. The cheerleader of the week goes to Savannah McDonald. Thank you for your hard work. Sound of Midway, your 2023-2024 Paris Strumline.
give another round for the Paris Drumline. Now assembling on the 50 yard line, your Parrish Rosette. of the Rosettes are Motivational Sergeant Kate Sportswriter, Community Sergeant Courtney Schultz, Social Media Sergeant Sidney Phelps, and Promotional Sergeant Abby Bruner. The, the Rosette of the Week is Maddie Phillips. Now sit back and enjoy the traditional field shirt routine to Sweet Carolyn.
And here they are, the Paris Show Jacks. The Lotus Managers are Reese Park, George Dunk, Nick Tyler, and Jillian Clark. The directors of the Paris Show Jacks are Mrs. Megan Bowen and Mrs. Steve Sanders. And I'm Carly Tanina, the voice of the Rojax. With the fans, we had a new tradition at halftime debuting this evening. This season for home games, led by the captains and seniors on the team, the Panthers will select a teacher who has made an impact on them by presenting a game ball. This week's first recipient is Dr. Brad Blue. A social studies teacher in the upper school, Dr. Blue's influence has been felt in both the classroom and on the field. From his support on the sidelines to his construction of highlight videos and to spending extra time helping students on assignments, the football team wishes to thank Dr. Blue for his positive influence and guidance. Please give a round of applause one more time for Dr. Brad Blue.
Eric Walker fans, the gas will be barbecue says they still have sauce in front of chips. And turkey eggs available for you. They are out of biscuit. And they're just left on that. Sauce in front of chips. Turkey legs. Gospel barbecue to be located outside the home stand. Welcome back to Gloria H. Snyder Stadium here in Farmers Branch, Texas, alongside Jim Dixon and our sideline reporter Spencer Pattison. This is Brian Shackelford bringing you live exclusive coverage of tonight's Parrish Panther football game as the Panthers are in a battle right now with the Episcopal School of Houston Knights. A 13-7 lead for Episcopal School of Houston here at the halftime break. And Jim, we're ready to begin the third quarter of action here shortly. And as we've been discussing here during the halftime festivities, it's a situation where one of these teams just needs to get out of their own way, quit making the small mistakes on offense that have been hurting them, and continue to capitalize on what they've been doing positively on the defensive side of the football and get some separation from the other team here in this second half. I, I To me, I, I'd, go, I, I'd go on an all-points bulletin search for Mo. Yes. Whoever can find Mo can pull this thing off in the second half. And that's the whole thing is, is I, unfortunately, I think, I think uh, you know, Houston, Houston is – Houston Bel Air has, has captured that at least that carryover from the first half, although they don't really have anything to show for it. But, uh, you know, if you have a sustained drive, you, cu- you follow it up with, uh, with a, tight, a tight defensive stand and uh, and and you're gonna you know you're gonna come out on the top end of this thing. Indeed. Now the defense has both defenses have played very well here in this first half, and it's been small offensive miscues for Parrish. It's two interceptions by Sawyer Anderson that the Episcopal School of Houston Knights have turned into 13 points. And for Episcopal School of Houston, it's been the snap miscues and other issues in the red zone that have kept them from having possibly as many as 28 and could be 35 points here in the first half. Oh, yeah. If they could execute inside their, you know, in, inside the 30, you know, we'd have a whole different ball game right now. And, folks, while we have a moment, we're going to go back down to the sideline as Spencer Pattison is standing by with associate head coach John Scully. Coach Scully, you – your team had a, had a rough first half, two goal line stands. What was the mindset at halftime? Positive, optimistic, take it one play at a time. You know, we've got a rather young, inexperienced defense, but these kids are here to battle. They're battling every play. They're going to do it the second half. Two tough breaks in the first half. We should have 14 more points on the board than we do. Great goal line stands by, by, uh, by our opposing team. We'll get over that. Great confidence in our offense, great confidence in our young guys who are out here to play hard tonight. Yeah, Sawyer Anderson, two interceptions in the first half. Uh, what What's his goal uh, going into the second half? 
very uncharacteristic of Sawyer to make any mistakes. I mean, the guy is top flight in every regard. So uncharacteristic, Sawyer's the kind of guy who moves right through that and gets his mind right back on the task at hand. Got every confidence that he'll get it done second half. Thank you, Coach. Guys. Spencer, and we're ready to get the second half underway, and we thank Associate Head Coach John Scully for his time as we're ready to open the third quarter and Parrish will have the ball here to start the third quarter, Jim. And as we were briefly lamenting here during the halftime break on how nice it would have been had the Panther offense been able to capitalize before halftime because they would have had the opportunity here coming out to open the third quarter to double dip. Yeah, and that's, I mean, that's oftentimes the game plan uh, for Parrish is, is get on a run, get on a run, and, and, and almost, you know, they know that they, you know, traditionally and typically they know that they're going to close out the second half and then they're going to double dip. They're going to they're going to keep that momentum in their pocket. And as Coach Scully said, I mean, a lot of this is uncharacteristic. Uh, a lot of this is, is, you know, just kids not doing what they typically do. And, you know, they need to, as a, as a team, you know, get it all harnessed together get all the horses pulling in the same direction and uh and and you know get that momentum going indeed and i think that coach steve lease of beller episcopal on the opposing sideline would probably use the exact same adjective to describe his offensive play in the red zone in this first half as well uncharacteristic i mean what four snaps over the head a bad snap causing a fumble and we'll see how things pan out here as Logan Phillips puts his foot into the ball. Carson Darby with the return from the 20-yard line. And the third quarter is underway here tonight at Snyder Stadium. Darby with a shake and bake at the 35. Still on his feet. And finally taken down at the 37-yard line. Nice kick coverage there. The tackle by number 22, Devontae Taylor. And a great return by Carson Darby to start the third quarter for Parrish. And I'll still I'll say this. There's still nobody that wrapped that kid up. No, well... I'm- The first man hasn't done it so far, and we've watched him play in six quarters of football so far this season, and I have yet to see a single man bring Carson Darby to the turf. Well, I mean, you know, he 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 takes his hits, but I mean, you don't get you don't get a handle on him, and uh, and he's going to make you pay at some point. First and ten from the thirty-seven yard line, Maddox Reed takes the handoff, big hole, thirty-five yard line, forty-five midfield. And just what we were talking about during the halftime break, the focus by the defensive coordinator James Monahan and the Episcopal Knights has been covering the passing game, and it's been huge holes in the middle for Maddox Reed. He gains 12 there, but now he's slow to get up off the turf. Yeah, I mean, and you you hope he he's coming up, and he's going to have to come off. Yeah, he's got a got a leg issue, and uh, but I mean, they're exactly what you're talking about, right on cue. Wear that thing out inside the tackles and make them play football, and uh, and that's going to open up other things. That's going to that's going to force your or, or give you opportunity on the passing on the passing game. And unfortunately, there Maddox Reed shaking up on the play, but now he's jogging his way back to the sideline. It looks like that may have just been a uh, rolled ankle for just a second. Hopefully he'll be back to return momentarily. And we'll replay, we'll restart now. First and 10 at midfield for the Panthers as they have the opening possession of the third quarter. Anderson rolling to his right. He's gonna crow back against the green Bryson Fields and the officials say he did not get a foot in and looks like a good call on the sideline and he, as he's covered by Carson Fowler on the play for Bel Air Episcopal. Yeah, Fields was just running out of, downhill out of bounds. Just could not get that drag foot down uh, to complete that reception. Otherwise, that would, that would have been an outstanding play. Yeah, just short of a nice 15-yard gain there for the Panthers. Instead, it will be second down and 10 at midfield as the Panthers, for the third time tonight, look to take the lead. They did lead earlier or pardon me, they were had the game tied at seven. They have not led yet tonight. Anderson now going deep for Fields on the near side. And just overthrowing Fields, step for step with Fields. Number three, Christian Houston, the junior cornerback for Bel Air Episcopal. But Fields did have a step and did have the position on the outside shoulder. Yeah, just unable to accelerate down the line and, and, and pick that thing up. 
And now this will be an interesting play here on third down as Reed back in the game for the Panthers. Third down and 10 at midfield. Trips to the bottom side. And now Novikov will change the play as the play clock looks like it expired. Now a play clock under 10 at four. Third down and 10. Anderson in the pocket. He's going to take off and run. Can he get to the marker? It's going to be close. And they're marking him a full two yards short. So a, a very favorable spot for Episcopal as Brady Reed makes the tackle. It looked like he got to the 41, but they're marking him down at the 42-yard line. And I'm sure Novikov will go for it here on fourth down and two in plus territory. Yeah, I mean, there's really, you know, with the ball placement, there's not a lot to do on this edge of the field that's going to be, uh, you know, that's going to be beneficial other than converting. Maddox Reed on fourth down and two. The ball loose. Sawyer Anderson recovers the fumble, but they're going to say Reed was down after getting the first down. And Reed once again heavily favoring that left foot or that right foot. And he may need assistance to get off the field. Subbing in for Reed will be number 20, the junior Jackson Sanford. It will be a first down for the Panthers. They do not give forward progress on the fumble. So they're saying that at the spot where Maddox Reed fumbled the football, he had first down yardage. Yeah, and, and as Reed comes off, I mean, again, you know, the last two series or the last two play, last two plays in this series, he's come off. Never been evaluated, and he's really kind of struggling against that. Wants to stay on the sideline, report back in, and they should probably set him out, figure out what's going on, and at least see if, see if they can tape it up. First down and 10 now with the Bel Air 40-yard line. Sawyer Anderson rolling to his right, rolling out of the pocket. He's going to pull it down and scamper out of bounds after yeah, a short game. Looks like he might have gained a yard on the play. No, instead they'll mark him right at the 40 for no gain. No gain it brings play. up second down and 10. Down, 10. Yeah, back to that line we talked about in the first half. Preston Ward was on that edge and and had his man, uh, and, you know, he just turned him loose off the block knowing that he was going to get called for a hold and very mature uh, choice knowing that knowing that, uh, that Anderson could get loose and he could still turn his guy turn his guy loose on the, on the pursuit. Trips to the bottom of your screen on second down and 10. At the Bel Air Episcopal 40, Anderson looking to throw. He wants the single back to the far side looking for Crow. Did he make that catch? Yes, he did. Hudson, or Hutch Crow with the catch, puffing the chest out at the 11-yard line. That is the third amazing catch so far this season, the second one tonight. How he pulled that down out of double coverage, I, I'll never know. That's just a magician's play right there by Hutch Crow. 30 yards and a first down. Yeah, Crow again, just a hand hand uh, taller than the defenders, pull that thing down. An amazing catch by Crow will set up first down and ten at the Bel Air 11 yard line. Maddox Reed back in the game, hit in the backfield by Ty Blevins, but manages to spin and gain two on the play. They'll mark the ball at the nine, just inside the ten yard line. We'll call it a short two. Sets up second down and eight. Yeah, this is this is that time that you know Paris just really needs to needs to knuckle down, get after the ball, get in the end zone, and see if they can sort this thing out later on. Second down and eight at the ten yard line as Anderson looking to throw. He wants Crow again in the end zone. Lots of contact there. I mean, was it just me, Jim, or did we see I saw, the the, the I receiver saw, get pulled back towards the defender? I saw Jersey getting pulled. But. Yeah. I'm not down there. Yeah, we're not. We're looking from about uh, 200 feet away, but it looked like Bryson Fields had his jersey jerked pretty good. They don't call it, and it's going to set up third down and eight. Trips now. No spread formation here on third and eight at the Bel Air Episcopal 10-yard line. The play clock at 10 as Novikov will change the play. Sawyer Anderson, Maddox Reed to his right. They'll go for the... End zone this way. Oh, and it's dropped by Colgan Pettit. Pettit made the move in the end zone to get inside his defender. The ball hit him right in the hands. He just couldn't hold on. 
Yeah, Pettit just had to get had to sweep to the back side of that defender, get his hands free, and really pulling his hands up to receive the ball. Just a little late on that, and that resulted in that drop. And in trots the field goal unit. Dylan Sherman will have Drew Burton spot the ball at the 17-yard line. This will be a 27-yard field goal attempt. The kick is down on its way, and the 27-yard field goal is good. And positive points here for the Panthers on the opening drive of the third quarter. Your score, folks, with 8.57 remaining in our third quarter here at Snyder Stadium. It's now Episcopal School of Houston Knights 13, your Parish Panthers 10. And, Jim, not what we really wanted to see there with an opening touchdown drive, but at least three points on the board on this first drive of the third quarter. Hey, points are points. I mean, you'd love to have the seven, but uh, but three works t- works just as well. Gets you almost halfway there, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, I mean, and 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 you don't, you don't care where they come from or how much they are. You just gotta you have to you have to generate points on every drive and create separation and uh, and make sure your defense holds and your defense. You know, if they if they net out uh, net out two possessions, game over. And this will be the opportunity here where the Parish Panther defense will look to, as you put it earlier in the first half, Jim, steal a possession from Bel Air Episcopal. This might be the time that you were talking about for uh, Dylan Sherman to pull out the sandwich and have that ball check up at about the two-yard line. Garson Sampson deep for Bel Air Episcopal as Dylan Sherman set to kick with 8.57 to play in the third. No, it's an onside kick. Up in the air and recovered by Mayfield. They went one better on me, Jim. We thought it would be Dylan Sherman checking it up, but they went for the full onside kick. And Julian Mayfield secures possession for the Panthers. That was executed to perfection. That You couldn't, you couldn't ask for anything. Better. No, perfect bounce right over the head of the front line. Great pickup by Mayfield. Yeah, I mean, Mayfield, Mayfield it landed right in his mitts. He, he caught it on momentum, got an extra four or five after that, and, uh, and, and Parrish is looking to steal one. Like, you know, you don't care how the possession comes. Well, they just stole a possession there, and, of course, Mayfield recovering the onside kick cannot advance the football. Yeah. So Parrish will take over where he recovered at the Bel Air Episcopal 48-yard line with 8.57 to play. So now the Panthers have stolen a possession from the Knights. Let's see what they can do. Anderson, the delayed Draw handoff to Maddox Reed. Big yardage for Reed. First down and more inside the 35 to the 33 yard line. And that draw just enough to freeze the offensive front for Bel Air Episcopal. And Reed gains 15 on the play. Well, I, I think the thing that's unsaid on this is you have Bel Air Episcopal coming back out onto the field after feeling like, okay, we, we held them to a field goal. Now they're back out on the field, and that's got to that's gotta just wear you out. You know, the defense having to get right back out on the field. And I think uh, you had talked about it before that the Panthers may have found Mo here in the third quarter. Anderson fakes the handoff. He'll keep on the end around, gets across the 30. A nice block there from Bryson Fields. And Anderson down to the 28-yard line. And perhaps the elusive momentum has reared its ugly head. It's no longer on the milk carton. We may have found him here on the home sideline with eight minutes to play in the third. Oh, for sure. And, and Anderson, I mean, Anderson is showing speed and burst that I, we didn't see last year. No, we didn't. Not at all. Second down and four. I mean, he had speed, but not speed like this. He's definitely done some work in the offseason. Anderson looking to throw the quick hitter complete to Crow. And Crow will make the catch. He might be just a shade short of the first down. We're see, we'll see where the line judge. No, the line judge is signaling first down and 10. The spot right at the 24-yard line. So good situational awareness by Crow to stick that ball out toward the end zone and get that extra yard to move the sticks. No, and that's one thing that I've always said about, about this receiving core. They're very disciplined. They know what they have to do. If they, if they need eight yards, they run an eight-yard pattern. And, uh, and, and you you got to, you know, that's instilled in them and uh, it carries through with that football IQ. Trips to the top on first and 10 at the 24. The pass complete in the middle. Bryson Fields turns the corner inside the five and down to the three-yard line. The stop pattern there to Bryson Fields right in 
the dead spot in that zone from the Knights. He converts the play for 21 yards, first and goal. Yeah, and it's, it's, it's as you alluded to in the first half. That run, you know, that run is setting that up. That run is opening up that underneath uh, that, that now Parrish is able to exploit. Remaining in the game at tailback, number 20, Jackson Sanford, first and goal. The handoff to Carson Darby. And it looks like the Knights read that all the way as Darby will lose a yard. They'll call it a loss of a yard back to the five-yard line, setting up second down and goal. Yeah, it, it, I mean, Parrish needs to, uh, with everything they have invested in this drive, they really need to finish it up with something more than a field goal. Yeah, a tie game here. You know, if they come away here making it 13-13, it'll almost feel like a victory for Bel Air Episcopal on this drive. A critical possession here. As the clock moves under seven minutes to play in the third, second down and goal, Parrish at the Knights' five-yard line. The full spread formation. Anderson loses the snap. Couldn't find the handle on the football. And he'll lose 11 yards on the play back to the 16-yard line. Yeah, and that I mean, that's just horrible, uh, horrible timing, especially inside the 20. You just really can't have that happen you have to be a lot more disciplined than what they're showing on uh you know uh, particularly on the last five plays or four plays of the series now third and goal all the way back at the 17 yard line the play clock at 15 as novikov will change the play from the sideline down to eight on the play clock third down and goal panthers and instead novikov wants to talk it over and he'll spend his first time out of the half with 608 remaining in the third well, and I, I think I think that just shows the critical nature of this of this series. I mean, he really, really wants to walk away with a touchdown, and uh, and feels like that you know we've we've invested a lot in that to do that, um, you know, to 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 convert convert on two series to ten points. That's that's tremendous. Indeed, you'd hope that they can find a way to score here, score the touchdown. But with the ball all the way back at the 17-yard line, we'll just have to see how this shakes out. But they, as they've, you know, the axiom you've always heard is in the first in the first half you take your timeouts when you when you want to, in the second half you take them when you need to. And Coach Novikov felt it was important enough here with 6:08 remaining in the third to spend his first timeout to make sure they get this play right on third and goal. Well, and we talked about it even last year. I mean, it, it's really an investment timeout. This, this not, one is, yes. Yeah, it's really, it's really stop, gather, take a breath, know what you got to do. Let's get, let's get everybody back on the right page. And now, Jim, is this four down territory, or do you bring in the field goal unit if you're unsuccessful here? No, I, I, I mean, if Bel Air's not going to show me anything on, on their side, I'm happy to bury them deep and, and roll the dice on the touchdown. Anderson to throw on third down and goal, looking for Crow, and just overthrows him. Anderson took a hard shot on that throw, but was willing to stay in the pocket, and Crow laid out completely for that one. May have knocked the wind out of himself on the landing as he's still down on the turf. They got the right play in, Jim, and it was just barely missed on the execution. And now it sets up fourth down and goal back at the 17-yard line. Yeah, just a foot long, and, and uh, I think they're gonna I think they're gonna opt for the three. And well, and, you have to at this point oh, from yeah, the 17. You, yeah. And Crow, okay, it just he stretched all the way out, laid out, and hit the ground hard. Probably just knocked the wind out of him for a second. And on consecutive possessions, we will see the right leg of Dylan Sherman once again. The ball spotted at the 17-yard line. Drew Burton will make the spot at the 24-yard line. This will be a 34-yard attempt as Dylan Sherman hit moments earlier from 23 yards out. The kick on its way. Oh, it's blocked. Blocked on the play by by Episcopal School of Houston with the block, number 22, Devontae Taylor. And the worst possible outcome there, no points on the onside kick after they recover successfully a blocked field goal will give Episcopal School of Houston the ball and imagine this Jim we're halfway through this third quarter 557 remaining in the third and this will be the first offensive possession for the Bel Air Knights first and 10 at their own 28. Right and you know and they really have to come out and answer they really got to put something on the board and see if they can recapture and and uh and get this thing going it, it you know 
get going downhill, and uh, they haven't been able to do that in, you know, in, throughout the second quarter. Carson Gordon hands off on first down. Brandon Thomas with the carry, diving across the 35. And Brandon Thomas out to the 36-yard line. It's a gain of eight on the play. And this was a young man that was playing football last year for Houston Lamar, now wearing the dark blue and white of Episcopal School of Houston, gaining eight on the play. Yeah, I mean, he is, I mean, he's really kind of changed the focus of what they're what they do offensively uh, as far as the Knights. Second down and two for Bel Air Episcopal. Gordon with the snap. He'll hand off once again to Thomas. Thomas has the first down across the 40 to the 41 yard line, making the tackle Caleb Bowers along with number 33 Hurley Weikert. But they do move the sticks and even with a narrow three point lead, the Episcopal Knights are grinding clock here in the latter half of quarter number three. Yeah, Brian, and, and it goes back to what you what you said with Parrish. I mean, they they need to own in between the tackles, and that's what uh, that's what Bel Air's doing right now. They're 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 coming out and they're run it and, and uh, gains and, and Parrish needs to figure out how to stop that. First and now for Knights at the own forty one yard line, four forty four play in the third. Carson back to throw on first down. Yeah, Thomas in the flat is going to hit the underneath route here on the side. And the catch made by number 18, Garen Simpson. And Simpson able to make that catch all the way down to the Panther 35-yard line. That's a pass play of 24 yards to move the sticks. Yeah, it looked like to me he was out, out about on the 40. It looks like he stepped out. Uh, you know, the linesman didn't didn't call that, and, and nobody really came up to to, to stop it. Parrish had, Parrish had to continue out to play for an extra five. Right, and uh, effective play call there by a Bel Air Episcopal. They had Julian Mayfield on an island. He didn't know which of those two receivers to defend. Went with the deep receiver, and Simpson wide open on the underneath route. Now Carson Gordon with the keeper on first and ten. He'll try to turn the corner. Instead, he'll just scamper out of bounds at the 31-yard line for a gain of four. And Gordon has been very effective this evening, avoiding contact from that Panther defense when he senses – the gentleman in the red jersey's nearby. He just scampers out of bounds on the sideline. He is not looking for contact here tonight at Snyder Stadium. No, and he'll and he'll give up. You know, he'll give up a little bit of ground, knowing he could go outside and get more. And the clock winding under four and a half remaining here in the third quarter, as it's second down and six for Episcopal at the Parish 31-yard line. A tight bunch formation with two receivers to the top side. And it's Thomas again. He'll come to the near side. Big hole penalty flag on the play. Thomas all the way down to the nine-yard line. Tackled by D.C. Crane. But I'm pretty sure we've got a hold on Episcopal back here near the line of scrimmage. Yeah, I, I think I, I think that freedom, yeah, that freedom came with a little bit of cost. I think that the, you know I think that end got got held up a little bit and. Uh, Holding number 79 on offense. 10 yards from the spot. Still second down. And indeed, they get uh, Jack McKinney with the hold. And that will move the ball back 10 yards and set up second down and 16. You know, and again, and again, inside, you know, inside, in that scoring zone, again, shooting themselves with penalties, After shooting the themselves the with, uh, with miscues. And Hutch Crow now in the game on Touchdown. defense. He'll take the free safety spot as it's second down and 13 for Bel Air Episcopal. The ball at the Parish 38-yard line. Carson Gordon with Thomas in the backfield. Play action. Blitz coming. Gordon still with plenty of time. He's going to take off down the field, get around Bowers, and scampers out of bounds at the 30-yard line. He'll gain eight on the play. And Bowers almost had him by the ankle. But it's still an eight-yard gain to set up third in a short five. Wait, and Wilker, I mean, Wilker exploded off the snap, got into the got into the deep backfield, and just unable to, to, to catch up. I mean, th this kid is just really athletic, and unless you could just, you know, just get him right in his sternum and wrap him up, you're not going to bring him down. And this now another critical third down for the Panther defense. Third down. We'll call it a long four at the Panther 29-yard line. Carson Gordon will take the snap. He'll hand off to Thomas, 
and Thomas wrapped up. Big hit there by Caleb Bowers. As Bowers, along with number 54, Ty Whitty, make the stop, and they force fourth down. Yeah, I mean, they got great punch off the ball, really kind of set their, set their perimeter inside the tackles and just really kind of cleaned the mess up. And it looks like Coach Lease and his team will go for it on fourth down. I wonder if we'll see another uh, play here from the back of the playbook. They've already played. They've already had two flea flickers in this game. Well, I mean, when you when you bring the back of the playbook to the front of the playbook, then the front of the playbook's the back of the playbook. So. <laughs> Fourth down and four for Bel Air Episcopal. Gordon back to throw all day long, looking to scramble, and he's got the first down still on his feet inside the 10 and taken down at the nine-yard line. Wrapped up by number 28, Guy Stern, but just too much room for the speed of Carson Gordon, and he'll gain 25 yards and a first down. Yeah, and, and Gordon kind of got up a little gingerly. That's really the only second time, that's the second time this game that they've really kind of gotten under his pads, got a hold of him and brought him down to the ground. And it's now first down and goal for Bel Air Episcopal at the Parish nine-yard line. Clock just over two and a half. And we've got a stoppage of time on the field. And a timeout taken by Bel Air Episcopal. The Knights will spend their first timeout. And while we have a moment, let's go back down to the sideline and Spencer Patterson. Guys, the, the big, big missing piece on this defense is Caleb Mitchell Irving. He's out with an ankle injury that he suffered in the scrimmage two weeks ago, but he's not all missing. He is there on the sideline, leading his team on, giving them insight as much as possible. It's been really awesome to watch as he's been a great leader for this team. Guys. Thank you, Spencer, and it is true. I mean, Caleb Mitchell Irving not playing here tonight. And you would like to think that he would help contain Carson Gordon in the pocket a little bit were he able to play out there tonight on the field. Well, and, and, and at least it, it it limits your options to one side of the field. That's it correct. Really, it really does. And, and, and you have to account for a kid like that. But the fact that he's on the sideline uh, stepping up as a leader is an absolute tribute to, to, to him and this program and, and, and Parish football on a whole. Because, I mean, Coach Novikoff appreciates leadership, but he knows later on in life that's what they're going to do. Indeed, and that young man will be playing football next fall for the Purdue Bowler Makers. But he still has his senior season to finish out here following the recovery from injury here in 2023. Mm -hmm. And now that the Episcopal Knights have taken their first time out, they'll rush to the line following the Sugar Huddle first and goal at the nine-yard line. Carson Gordon under center. And the handoff to Thomas, and he's stuffed in the backfield. Coming up to make the play, that's number 54, Ty Whitty, the defensive end, a loss of one. And again, we saw this in the Alito game. I mean, really, the defense was kind of flat the entire, the entire first half. And again, comes out and kind of answers the bell here in the second half. Guys are stepping up, making plays. A lot of these plays that happened in the in the first half were for long gains. Now they're stopping them behind the line of scrimmage, and you got to wonder, okay, you know, when you readdress at halftime, okay, let's keep that focus for the first half of next game. Indeed, and number one, Brandon Thomas down on the turf for Bel Air Episcopal. As the running back was shaken up on that tackle, he tried to get back to the huddle and then fell down on the blue turf. He's being attended to by the Bel Air Episcopal staff. So he'll have to come out for a play. So we'll probably see number eight, Carson Fowler, in the game, substituting Thomas. And Fowler has his own dose of speed to add to this Knights attack. So it will be an interesting play coming up here on second down and goal for the Knights. Yeah, I mean, you got to wonder coming out of this what they're going to kind of shake up uh, because because the what's been their bread and butter in the first half has kind of been shut down a little bit. A 13-10 lead here for Bel Air Episcopal with the clock running two minutes, just over two minutes to play in the third quarter. And the Knights driving second down and goal at the Parish Panther 10-yard line. A single slot tight end set. For the Knights, the snap back to Gordon. Fakes the handoff to Carson Fowler. He's going to look into the end zone. No short. 
And the pass caught, but a great tackle by D.C. Crane, making the reception the tight end, Will Masterson. But he's taken down at the five-yard line. It's just a gain of five, bringing up third down and goal. Yeah, Crane with a good a good stop in space. A great way to pick the guy up on the sideline and ride him out. And this is the point right here. The Panther offense has suffered two goal line stops at the hands of the Knights defense. And now it's time for the Panther defense to return the favor as it's third down and goal for Bel Air Episcopal. The play clock moves under 10 as they break the huddle. Third and goal at the Panther five yard line. They're trying to reset the play. Play clock down to two, down to one. And running out on the field to call timeout, Coach Steve Lease. With 61 seconds remaining in the half, he'll spend his second time out. Yeah, and Gordon really kind of felt like he had a hand up on it, uh, felt like if they could have pulled the play off that, that it was going to be successful. It was kind of, you know, a little frustrated by the, quick, uh, by the quick timeout. Yeah, it looks like he saw something because when the timeout was called, he was jumping up and down in frustration. He may have seen a weak spot or th- something that he thought he could exploit, but... Coach Lease didn't like how the play was developing and thought it was worth spending his second time out of the half. Well, I, I'd have spent it when they broke the huddle and they didn't know where to go. Yeah, man. and those those wideouts were kind of searching for searching for which side they need to be on, and I, I think they still had I think they still had a wide out to the to the near side that was supposed to be up on the slot. Indeed, and uh, what Mr. Gordon didn't see when he was trying to snap the football is had the timeout not been called, number eighty three, that was or eighty one rather. No, 83, Tate Oregon, was trying, Tate Oregon was trying to line up on the far side. He wasn't set, and that would have been an illegal motion penalty on that play anyhow. Didn't see that. You have better eyes than I do. Well, 83 was the one with his hands in the air. That's true. And he was still moving to the side and trying to get his feet, snit, get his feet set when the, when the snap yeah. occurred. This is the play they wanted right here. And we'll try again here for the Episcopal Knights. Thomas back in the game at running back. A minute and a one second to play in the third. Third down and goal. They switch to a wildcat look. The snap directly to Thomas. He's going to keep it and go straight ahead. And that didn't fool anybody. Jesse Richardson, number 19, making the tackle for Parrish. Along with, I believe that was number 27 for the Panthers, also on the stop. I might even make that number 77 in on the stop along with Richardson, Griffin Chambers. And it's now fourth down and goal. And the field goal unit is not on the field for Bel Air Episcopal. They're going for the touchdown. No, no. They, they, they feel like they need to recapture here and, and, uh, and get in the end zone. Well, we'll see what shakes out. Time for a goal line stand by your Panthers. Fourth down and goal for Bel Air Episcopal at the Parish five-yard line. A tight end spread formation. Gordon, shotgun, takes the snap. He's going to roll to the far side. It's going to be a race to the pylon. And Gordon will win it easily. A nice block there by Braden Thomas to give Gordon all the room he needed to scamper into the end zone for a five-yard touchdown run. Yeah, Gordon went out, uh, went out trailing trailing his running back, really set that angle on that lower side. You weren't going to beat him. No, there was just too much speed and too much room over to that open pylon. And now... The field or the extra point unit, the point after team on the field is number 37. Logan Phillips will attempt the point after. Anthony Saragusa to hold the long snapper. Morrow Evans, the Ohio State commit. The snap down and the kick by Phillips is good. And folks, your new score with 11 ticks remaining here in the third period at Gloria H. Snyder Stadium. It is now Episcopal School of Houston Knights 10. Your or pardon me 20. Your Parish Panthers 10. And what was a six-point lead at halftime is now a 10-point lead for the Knights late in the third quarter. Yeah, and uh, again, you know that series, that series that that uh, you know the first series in the in the second half, you know, it, it just didn't go their way, uh, the way of Parish, and then to follow it up to walk away with basically six points when uh, when you needed 14, the the- and uh, and that that swing. Uh, has put momentum on the uh, on the Houston Houston Bel Air Episcopal sideline. And now Sawyer Anderson and company will get the ball back to try to bite into what is now a 10 point lead, as Phillips will put his foot into the ball from the 40 yard line. A line drive kick taken by Carson Darby at the 18 yard line. 
Darby waving his way, 20, 25, has a seam at the 35. And I'll tell you what, see, he's still not down. We saw that play last week in Alito where they called him down even though he had not touched the turf. And I'm with you, Jim. I like what I see out of this young junior. Carson Darby is not afraid of contact. He is not afraid to hustle. And a great kick return there. He gains, what, 20, 21 yards on the kick return to give Parrish first and 10 at the 37-yard line. Yeah, I mean, and he's, he's a great athlete. He gives you a lot of dimension. You can do stuff with him, um, you know, all these receivers are talented, but he's he's a kid that you can you know like like you you, know, you got him in the backfield right now. First down and ten, the handoff to Darby, as Maddox Reed will get a rest, and he's taken down at the line of scrimmage with the stop for Bel Air Episcopal. That's number eighty-eight, the defensive end Cullen Walton. As the horn sounds, ending our third quarter of play. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got three quarters in the books here this evening at Gloria Snyder Stadium as Game On Sports brings you live exclusive coverage of tonight's Parish Panther football game. And your score at the end of three quarters of play here in Farmers Branch, Texas. Episcopal School of Houston Knights 20, your Parish Panthers 10. And while we have another moment, let's go down to the sideline and Spencer Pattison. <laughs> Thank you, Spencer. And we're ready to begin quarter number three. And Sawyer Anderson and company will have the football second down and ten. Anderson, opening play of the fourth quarter. He'll take off and scramble and slide across the 40. And that was dangerously close to a late hit as he slid to the turf. But somehow, Sean Thompson does not get flagged on the play for the Knights. I think he, I think he grazed him with the bullet. Four yards on the play. He went right over the top Just of it. Just grazed him a little bit, huh? Well, it's a gain of four on the play for Sawyer Anderson on the scramble. And as the moon starts to rise in the eastern sky here in Farmers Branch, Texas, it's now third down and six for the Panthers. The quick hitter to Crow. Crow gets a block from field, and shedding the block to make the tackle. A nice play there by the quarterback number three, Christian Houston, to limit the gain by Crow to three yards. And it looks like with 11-18 to go here and trailing by 10, Novikov will go for it on fourth down, and we're going to call it fourth and a short three. Yeah, and, and, and the Knights are, the Knights are going to make Parrish earn it. I mean, they could get the first down, but they're going to earn it. And they're not, let, they're not giving up the big gain. Fourth down and three now for Parrish. As Anderson back to throw, he's going to take off and run. Does he have room to get to the marker? He does. Just barely getting the first down. It looked like it might have been a face mask penalty at the end. The tackle by Cullen Walton. No flag on the play, but the important thing is Anderson moves the sticks. First and ten perish. Yeah, I mean, that you know, that series right there was not – that's not that that's not textbook perish. But uh, effective, but they need to string these together and uh, and figure out how to exploit what uh, what Bel Air is going to give them. And now first and ten, Panthers at the 48 yard line. Anderson back to throw again. The blitz coming in. He'll hit the sideline route. And was the catch made? Yes, it was. Carson Darby with two feet in bounds. Or no, they're calling it incomplete. Correction. Now it's called incomplete. I thought that they were ruling Darby complete at the night 45, but instead they say incomplete out of bounds, second and 10. Yeah, and, and, and Preston Ward on the far side, the, the far side tackle, he's, I mean, playing outstanding. He's, he's, he's keeping his man in contain. He's, he's, uh, he's creating lanes, and uh, he finished the block 20 yards behind the line of scrimmage on that last play. And the ball thrown in the dirt in the direction of Carson Darby on second down and 10. As Anderson under heavy pressure that time from number 99, Tyler Cesarski. And Anderson just throwing the ball away, and we'll see what the Panthers can do now on third and 10 at their own 48. They'll put five men in the pattern, trips to the bottom. 
on third and 10. As now Novikov will change the play, the play clock down to 15. It looks like a blitz look. Anderson back to throw. Straight across the middle for Crow. Oh, and it's picked off. Bouncing out of Crow's hands and intercepted by number eight, Carson Fowler. And Darby making the tackle, trying to strip the ball, and you can't blame him there. But just another unfortunate, I mean, that's two interceptions tonight for Sawyer Anderson that were not his fault as that ball in the hands of Hutch Crow and the defensive back for Bel Air Episcopal knocks the ball out and picking up the ball in midair, Carson Fowler with the pick. Yeah, I, I mean, and, you, know, you hate to see these these little these passages where the, where this offense is ineffective because really, it, you know, again, just a, a fingertip off, a misstep here, and that's what's resulting in these setbacks. And now with a ten point lead and the football, Carson Garden, Carson Gordon, and the Bel Air Episcopal offense will go back to work. It's been a touchdown here in the third quarter for Parrish. I mean, a field goal for Parrish, a touchdown for Bel Air Episcopal, making the score 20 to 10. Here with 10 and a half to play in the ball game, the receivers will switch sides once again. Brandon Thomas in the backfield with Gordon. Gordon will hand off to Thomas. Thomas cuts back against the grain. Two blockers and only two red shirts. A big run for Thomas down the sideline. And he'll get all the way down to the Panther 30-yard line. A 40-yard run for Brandon Thomas. And it looks like things are starting to fall apart here for the Panthers in the fourth quarter. Yeah, I mean, this is a stand that the, this is a stand that the defense really needs to look at, look at a takeaway. And, and, and they can't – you can't let these guys, uh, you know, get these 30-yard gains, 20-yard gains. A 40-yard gain right there for Brandon Thomas and the Bel Air Episcopal Knights. They were at their own 30-yard line. They're now at the Parrish 30-yard line. First down and 10. They keep the jumbo set with two receivers in. This time Carson Fowler with the carry, but he runs straight into number 33, Hurley Weicker. And Weicker making the stop along with number 60. Stop made by 33, Hurley, oh, Wicker. Yeah, number 60 on the tackle for Parrish. Yeah, and, and, I mean, the, yeah, Wicker on the, on the stop, but really just kind of got blown backwards. And, uh, and, and, and that line is really not forcing the issue. They're not wrapping up. They're not effective on their tackles. They are making stops, but it's kind of how they're doing it. And uh, it kind of tells me what their state of mind is right now. One yard gained on the play, second and nine now for Bel Air Episcopal. Just inside the Panther 30-yard line. Carson Gordon handing off to Carson Fowler. And Fowler once again with a short game. And another tackle for number 77, Griffin Chambers. As the backup Jack linebacker in there making a stop after a gain of just two. And, and Bel Air is just more than happy to just, just keep, keep possession, keep the ball moving forward. And, uh, and, and convert these, convert these, uh, these first downs. And following the three-yard gain, it will now be third down and seven for Bel Air Episcopal. The play clock under ten. Third and seven at the Panther 27-yard line. Carson Gordon back to throw, looking to his left. Plenty of time. Now here comes pressure. Chased down by Sattler. He looks with the open man on the sideline. And Masterson, the tight end, leaked out. But that pass out of bounds. And well defended by number six, Julian Mayfield. It's fourth down for Bel Air. Yeah, they, they you know, Bel Air still thinks that this is this is still reachable for Parrish. Otherwise, they'd probably just kind of try either try and bury him deep. And now another critical fourth down for both teams. Fourth down and seven for Bel Air Episcopal at the Parrish 27-yard line. The snap back to Carson Gordon. He's looking to throw. Has plenty of time. The pass complete, but the tackle made short of the first down. Carson Fowler makes the grab, 
but an outstanding play by the rover, number 23, Carl Cole Polka, will hold Carson Fowler two yards short, and it's first down and 10, Panthers. Yeah, Polka kind of kind of was riding along about three yards off, and uh, it just came in when the ball was released, and uh, it wrapped up. And good, nice finish, and uh, see what Parrish could do with the offense here. The Parrish offense back on the field, trailing by 10. With 8.34 remaining in the ball game. Sawyer Anderson and company with the football, first and 10 at their own 22-yard line. The handoff to number 20, Jackson Sanford. And Sanford straight up the middle, and I think he's got 10 on the play. He'll move the sticks on the first play of this drive, Jim. Yeah, I mean, I, I, hopefully this is something they can find out because I mean we've seen it fits and starts throughout the throughout the first half and then here in the here in the third and now fourth quarter. If you can open up in between the tackles, there's some opportunity for you, and they just, they don't hit it enough consistently and walk away from it. Go and go to the pass uh, where they where where they can make hay inside the tackles. And the clock now stopped with 8.17 remaining in the fourth quarter as the officials are discussing whether or not it's a first down. And they have made the call that it is not a first down. So give Jackson Sanford nine and a half on the play. And it's second down and a half yard to go for the Panthers. The fake to Sanford going down on the sideline for Fields. And that was just... Pass interference all the way. You see the flag on the field at midfield. I'm not sure if he was covering, if the defensive back on that side was covering Bryson Fields or asking him to dance. Uh, it, it did look like they were going for the uh, for the sequin globe. I'm saying it looked like a tango to me. It did. I mean, he was, he was draped and, and uh, never got his head around. Never turned his head around, had a big handful of red jersey. And as a result, that will move the ball 15 yards downfield. Well, why are they calling it a spot foul there back at the 42-yard line? Ball now up to the, Panther, the penalty occurred at midfield. Well, irregardless, it is a first down for Parrish. And we'll stop the clock with 8.06 to play as Panthers trail by 10. Sawyer Anderson fakes the handoff. Darby with the catch. He's got blockers out front coming to the sideline. He'll try to make a move. They're trying to strip the football. And that's, that's the first time tonight that Darby's aggress aggressiveness is going to cost him as he had about seven yards on the play at the 48-yard line, and instead they're going to tackle him for a gain of just two. I, I, st I still, you know, I like the effort. Oh, I, mean, I, I, I have to agree. It just It's kind of like uh, rolling the dice. It just didn't go his way that time. Yeah, I, I do like the effort and, and, and the fact, you know, he kept you – know, he stood there with the, with the out of with the, with the sideline, and, and the opportunity to go out, and he cuts back to get more yards. Now Anderson to throw, hits Darby in the pattern, on his feet, 40-yard line, first down and more. And Darby needs to be careful. He needs to get down on the turf before Episcopal of Houston starts to strip the ball from him. But he moves the sticks first down and 10 at the Knights' 35-yard line. I don't know. I mean, I'm, I'm not seeing him strip the ball. I think the kid's got a set of guns on him. I don't see him giving it up. Well, I hope that you're right. As we'll continue play here, the sticks do move for the Panthers. And as you said, Jim, you have to compliment Darby on the aggressive effort. He is not going to take his foot off the gas, especially with the Panthers trailing. First and 10, Parrish. Now at the Bel Air 35-yard line, Anderson will get the snap. He'll scramble to his left. Eludes a tackler. Now he's going to take off and run, get inside the 30, and turns nothing into something there. A seven-yard scramble for the quarterback. Yeah, I mean, and very heads up to tuck and run. Um, you know, kind of kind of froze that corner out on an island and was able to take off and get the seven. From the night 29 yard line. He gets inside the Knights 30 to the Knights 29, and that's going to set up second down, and we'll call it a short four. About three and a half yards to go for the first down. But more importantly, the Panthers need 10 points, and they need them in a hurry. Anderson handing off to Jackson Sanford. Sanford straight ahead, and he's close to the first down marker, stopped a yard short with the tackle, defensive end, Walton, Walton for Bel Air Episcopal. Gain of a couple yards on the play. 
Colin Walton makes the stop to first third and less than a yard to go. Yeah, it's Sanford, another another you know another unknown that's getting an opportunity and contributing. The pass complete penalty flag comes in, or no, it's through the hands of Hutch Crow. Well, let's see what the penalty marker is. And it looks like the preliminary indication is a hold against Parrish. Number 67 on the offense. Yard, and Preston Ward Three, called for the down. hold. And Coach Lice will move, Coach Lease will move the Panthers back. And what was third down and one will be third down and eleven at the Bel Air Episcopal 36-yard line. And you know, and, and again, out on that edge, you're out there susceptible to that call. You really have to have you know have to have a, a good football IQ. Know what, know what you can get away with and know what you can't. Because i got news for you. Every snap of the ball, there's a hole. It all depends on whether or not they want to call it. And that time they did as it was affecting the play. Third down and, well, short 11, 10 and a half really, just outside the Knights 35. Anderson, play action, scrambling for his life, looking for somewhere to throw. And instead, he'll just throw the football on the ground at the feet of Carson Darby. Anderson's pass incomplete intended for zero Darby. And it will be third or fourth down and 11 fourth now for Parrish. Yeah, I, I, and unfortunately, they, they're in a situation where they just really have to convert and, uh, you know, may leave themselves a, a, a short field here to do so. Yeah, no choice left here with six minutes to play in the ballgame, trailing by 10. Fourth down and 11 for Parrish. The play clock down to 10 as Novikov will change the play once again. Play clock down to four. Fourth down. Anderson back. Looking to throw. Looking for Crow. He's got him. First down, Hutch Crow. Almost decapitated on the play by Devontae Taylor, but he breaks the tackle and has first down for the Panthers at the 12-yard line. And again, good vision. Crow, Crow comes across, picks the ball up, knows, knows who his defender is, knows that there's another guy coming across the top, and avoided that hit. And on first down, Jackson Sanford. the carry Move straight ahead out. by Jackson Sanford. He'll get inside the 10 to the 8-yard line. He's brought down by 25, Koppel. A stop a there for Zach Koppel, the backup linebacker for the Knights. Five. And Sanford, I mean, Sanford has not, you know, made error one. I mean, he's produced. He kind of got in his groove, uh, and, and he's doing a great job. And in the end of the side, oh, they try to find Bryson Fields in the corner of the end zone, in the near corner, and that's broken up by Christian Houston. Houston gets in there to poke the ball out, and it's now second down and five for Parrish. We'll call it second down and four at the seven-yard line. They can get a first down inside the three-yard line. It's third down and four at the seven. Yeah, and on this series, you're seeing a lot of exploitation of that defense that they've been, Paris has been able to be successful on. And now a whistle stops play. With eight seconds remaining on the game clock and 521 on the play clock. Or pardon me, 521 on the game clock, eight on the play clock. As for some reason, the officiating crew has stopped play. No penalty flag. And we'll check the call with Stacy Ashby and his crew. Third down. Third down. We'll reset now with a fresh 25 seconds. Five twenty-one to play in the ball game. And the Panthers are threatening. Third down and four at the Bel Air Episcopal seven-yard line. A spread formation for Sawyer Anderson. Sanford the back. Anderson back to throw. Max Blitz coming. And he throws over the head of Hutch Crow incomplete. And it's now third, or pardon me, fourth down, a critical fourth down and four coming up for the Panthers. Fourth down, five. And it looks like that they will bring on the field goal unit. 
Here with 5.16 to play in the fourth, Dylan Sherman to attempt the field goal out of the hold of Drew Burton. He's one of two on the evening. The spot, the kick is up. And the 24-yard field goal is good. And folks, your new score with 5.13 remaining in regulation here at Gloria Snyder Stadium in Farmers Branch. It's Episcopal School of Houston Knights 20, your Parish Panthers 13. And once again, Jim, they are able to get points, not a touchdown, but they have closed it to a one-score lead with 5.13 to play. Yeah, and, and, and all it does is tell your defense they have to go out and make a stand to keep you in this thing. And, uh, and these guys, I mean, I, 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 would, I would feel fine with this defense the way they've been playing in the second half. No, they've been playing great ball here in the second half. They've held Episcopal to only one score, a touchdown, as it's now 20-13. to 13, Six points scored in this second half by the Panthers on two field goals and one touchdown for the Episcopal School of Houston Knights. So what was a six-point lead at halftime is now seven at 20-13. to 13. And we've already seen the onside kick once in this game. I would think here with the elusiveness of Carson Gordon, well, we talked about it before. This might be the time for the sandwich from Dylan Sherman. Well, they're, they're giving it to you because they're playing on they, – they have hands team out playing the line. So we'll see what Dylan Sherman is set to do here. As he now has 10 kick coverage men on the field. The hands team definitely in for Bel Air Episcopal. A wide open field near the far sideline on the numbers at the 20. And I'm not sure that they've watched film on what Sherman can do. He'll pooch it up in the air over the head of Thomas. It checks up at the 8. Rolling, rolling, oh, and it just goes out of bounds. A nice try there by Sherman, and the execution just barely missed. It's been those tiny little things that just, I won't call that a mistake, Jim. That's just, it just didn't bounce Sherman's way because we've seen him do that before, and that ball just barely trickled out of bounds for an illegal procedure call. Yeah, you know, you got to get that ball to check up and roll back, but again, you're kicking it with your foot. Right. You're kicking a prolate steroid with your foot, which is not square either. Yeah. So anything could happen. That's what makes this sport of American football so great. And as a result of the illegal procedure penalty, the Bel Air Episcopal Knights will have the ball first down and 10 at their own 30-yard line with 5.13 to play. The Panthers need a stop. And they need it now. Two timeouts remaining for Parrish. One timeout remaining for Bel Air. Carson Gordon, the zone read to Thomas. And Thomas will gain four up the middle. Making the stop for Parrish. Number 77, Griffin Chambers. And number 60, Austin McLean. As the backup defensive line in to hold Brandon Thomas to a gain of four. Yeah, these kids got to get under pads, wrap people up, bring them down. Um, You know, they just can't. Can't, can't give up four yards, five yards at a whack. And more importantly now, the clock moving with 440 remaining in the ball game. As Bel Air Episcopal in no hurry here on second down and six at their own 34-yard line. The snap back to Gordon Hill. Keep it this time. Big hole on the near side. He's close to midfield. And as soon as D.C. Crane makes contact, Carson Gordon falls to the turf at the 48-yard line. A 14-yard gain, and Bel Air Episcopal stays in control first down and 10. Yeah, I mean, he gets gets the gain, and, uh, you know, he he basically dictates when the play's going to end. And, uh, you know, when you make gains like that, you can do that. We're now under four minutes remaining in the ballgame. As once again, Parrish has surrendered more than 400 yards of offense in this game. We have four minutes remaining. And the Bel Air Episcopal now with 437 yards in the game. Parrish with 451. Thomas on first and 10 gets stuffed on the play. Pushed backwards. A big play right there for the Jack linebacker, Hurley Weicker. And Brandon Thomas is going to lose a yard on first down. 
Three They'll call it a loss play. of... Uh, one yard on the play. Yeah, I was right the first time. They'll give him four progress of a one-yard loss on the play. Great hit by Hurley Weicker. Yeah, I mean, and they came in and finished up. And, and uh, uh, you know, that, that is, that's a good line stop. Um, and that's what you're looking for. And these guys got to start wrapping up and repeat that. Second down 11 now for the Bel Air Knights at their own 47. Three minutes to play in regulation. Gordon back to throw. Goes across the middle. And the pass caught down the sideline. Still inside the 25. And down to the 19-yard line. And that could be the backbreaker right there as Garen Sampson makes the catch. And a gain of 33 yards on the play. A 33-yard pitch and catch from Carson Gordon to Garen Sampson. And Episcopal now in the red zone once again. First and 10 at the Panther 19-yard line, but more importantly, the clock with less than two and a half minutes remaining in the fourth quarter. Sampson will now change direction, line up on the top of your screen. Brandon Thomas with the handoff. And Thomas squirts through down to the 17-yard line. He'll gain two on the play, making the tackle for Parrish. I believe that is, it is, in on defense, number 52, Sam Liu with the tackle. Yeah, and these unforced errors that have been killing uh, Episcopal, uh, Bel Air Episcopal in the first half and on into the early part of the second, have just, it's gone away. And, and they're just really playing uh, kind of in stride right now. And they, you know, they're just really in command. Parrish has to do something to, to break that. And we have a timeout here on the field as the Panthers have taken timeout with 2-12 remaining in the ballgame. Trying to save some time on the clock and see if they can keep the Episcopal School of Houston Knights off the scoreboard here to have a chance and keep this at a one-score game. Each team now with one timeout remaining. as we have 2.12 left to play. And we'll return to action now here in Jim. This is a critical series here because another first down with only one timeout remaining for the Panthers will give the Knights the opportunity to run out the clock. Yeah, I mean, they, they convert on this and, and, you know, they don't really have to do much after that. And, you, have, you know, you have the luxury of going out knowing, okay, get a first down or get that end zone. Second down and eight now following the timeout. The Knights with the ball at the Panthers 17 yard line. A tight jumbo package in. Gordon's going to roll to his right. Now he's going to take off against the grain. There's nobody there. Racing down the sideline and into the end zone. Nobody there to stop Carson Gordon. And a little bit over exuberant with the touchdown celebration. That's going to be an unsportsmanlike conduct. But the touchdown will stand, and that looks like it might be it for the Panthers here tonight in the home opener. Yeah, I mean they just uh, they haven't been able to to uh, you know to exercise what they what they're capable of doing. They haven't been able to consistently drive. We really only saw one sustained possession that resulted in a touchdown, and you know it, it just. It's just not hitting on all cylinders, and it's got to get there. Uh, you know, the fortunate side is it's not a conference game. It's not, you know, this doesn't matter. This is a tune-up. And we'll get the penalty call now from the referee, Stacy Ashby. And Carson Gordon is called for unsportsmanlike conduct for the excessive celebration in the end zone. Coach Novikov has accepted or has chosen to accept the penalty on the kickoff, but first Logan Phillips with the point after. The kick up by Phillips. 
and good. And folks, your new score with 2.03 remaining in the ball game here at Snyder Stadium. It's now Bel Air Episcopal Knights 27, your Parish Panthers 13. And while we have a moment, let's go down to the sideline one more time with Spencer Pattison. Guys, a really tough road ahead for Parish Episcopal. Alito last week, uh, Epi uh, Bel Air Episcopal this week. You got LBJ Austin next week, South Oak Cliff, and China Spring. Just like last year, it's a tough, tough start to the season, uh, and they're going to roll into next week uh, with some high hopes, guys. Thank you, Spencer. And now we'll see with 2:03 remaining if there is something left in the bag of tricks. As now. It will move the Panthers pretty much into desperation mode, Jim, down by two touchdowns with just over two minutes to play. Well, and, you know, I, they haven't played with desperation just yet. Um, you know, maybe that's what they need to get. You know, if anything, you could build on that for, next, for the next game. But you have to, you know, you have to play with desperation every series, and they really kind of haven't delved into that. No, I believe that's something that the coaching staff will work on this week is helping this team. I mean, it's a young team on the defensive side of the football with 10 new starters, and the only returning starter, Caleb Mitchell Irving, out this week with a foot injury. But I believe that will be the focus on both sides of the football this week as they gear up to host Austin LBJ next week right here at Snyder Stadium is to develop a sense of urgency all the time throughout the game. Logan Phillips with the deep kick and the return from the 26-yard line. Coming to the near side at the 35, 40, 45 midfield and more. All the way back into Knights territory. A big kick return right there for number 84, Marcus Hanish. And Hanish will put Parrish in business with a short field inside the Bel Air Episcopal 40-yard line. And, you know, you got to come out of the huddle. you got to be direct on what you're doing. You have to execute. You can't have these little false, false star, you know, setbacks. Um, you've really got to you really got to go for the end zone. 14 points down, a minute 55 to play in the ball game, but a short field following the big kick return by Hanish. First and 10 for the Panthers, and they're at the Bel Air Episcopal 41-yard line. Trips to the top of your screen. Anderson back to throw. He'll come to the near side, complete, and the quick catch made on the short grab by Moss McCaig. McCaig with a gain of six to the 36-yard line, and the Panthers go no huddle with just over 100 seconds remaining. Yeah, I mean, he went up and got it, came down. Nice possession. Anderson now throwing to the far sideline. Hutch Crow with the catch, and a penalty flag comes in as he'll move the sticks, and this may add 15 yards to that or half the distance to the goal on a face mask. Yeah, I mean, they, they got him on the spin around. They're, they're coming in. They're, they're, you know, they're trying to make a stop outside of the frame of their body. And when you start doing that, you're gonna, Marshall you're gonna foul. grab something. You're gonna face grab a face mask. mask. You're gonna get a horse collar. You're gonna do something that's gonna put you in the deficit. And it is a face mask penalty. More importantly, Jim, following the penalty, even though this tackle was made in the field of play, this will keep the clock stopped with 93 seconds remaining in regulation. Wait, wait, wait. They'll move the ball all the way down to the 15-yard line. Yeah, I, th I think just playing, just playing with abandon and and, and, and approaching approaching from a critical nature, I, I think that may just remove the mistakes. First and ten now for Parrish at the 15. Anderson, the pass, oh, just off the fingertips of Carson Darby. I'm not sure that that wasn't the best thing that could happen there because I think the tackle would have been made in the field of play by Ty Blevins after a very short game by Parrish. Yeah, I mean, Darby on that cross, he really had to get his head around and didn't know where the defender was um, other than other than when he went into the route. And, uh, yeah, I think you're right. I mean, they, they probably would have drug him down inside the field. Yeah, I think he would have lost yardage on the play and lost a lot more than the four seconds off the clock that they did. Discretion being the better part of Valor there. Second down and ten, Panthers. Anderson looking to throw. Now he'll look. And throw the same route and the same result just a little bit too wide for Hutch Crow. It's now third down and ten for Parrish. I mean, they they like they like what they see on that flat. They're they're coming out. Uh, they're forcing that they're forcing those corners up to get turned around, and that's opening up that underneath where they get. But it's still not enough room. And now on third down and ten, 
They'll have a standard spread formation. The running back in the game, number 20, Jackson Sanford to the left of Anderson. Third and 10. They'll hand off to Sanford. Sanford straight up the middle inside the 10, trying to get to that first down marker. And he'll be just and short. He'll gain Sanford. nine on the play down to the six-yard line. Yeah, and the Panthers will have to go quickly here on fourth down and one. 70 seconds remaining in the ball game. And here's the ball game, folks. Fourth down and a yard at the six. Anderson will keep himself burrowing straight ahead. And he'll have the first down at the three-yard line. They'll reset the offense quickly, Jim. Less than a minute to play. Yeah, and yeah, you've got to wonder where that was on a couple of plays earlier in the first half. He gets the first down. It'll be first and goal from the Indeed. ninth four-yard line. First and goal now at the four-yard line. Anderson back to throw, rolling to his right, throwing in the end zone. And a penalty flag. As reaching in front of Hutch Crow, Christian Houston will draw the flag, and that will move the ball to the two-yard line, and it will remain first and goal. And that was there was no draw on that. That was a pure penalty. The officials will meet now to discuss this call with 46 seconds remaining. And, Jim, if they can score here and get the onside kick, there's still time. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's not done. So a little bit of hope here, Panther fans, with less than a minute to play. We have 2,000 As the waning supermoon rising over the visiting stands. Holding Two penalty defense. flags on the play. That's offside the against the Knights and pass interference in the end zone. Coach Novikov will decline the offside and take the pass interference in the end zone. That puts the ball at the two-yard line, first down and goal. And more importantly, the clock will not start until the snap of the football. Five receivers in the pattern. Anderson back, looking to throw. The quick hit, complete. Touchdown, Harris Panthers. Just what they needed, but did they get it soon enough? Carson Darby with the touchdown reception. And we're back to a one-score game with 41 seconds to play. Yeah, and Darby, Darby again on that, on that, underneath, on that underneath flat. I mean, again... Rainer defender off, create space, come back. He still had to get, you know, an extra yard to get in the end zone. But great, great effort on the on the uh, on the route and great throw. Dylan Sherman now with the point after, and the extra point is good. Folks, our new score. With 41 ticks remaining in regulation play here at Gloria Snyder Stadium. It's Episcopal School of Houston Knights 27, your Parish Episcopal Panthers 20, and. It's not going to be any surprise to anyone in this stadium, Jim, what's coming up next. No, and, and, and it, it goes back to at the start of the, at the, start of the second half, was that, uh, was that a well-advised use of that onside kick to, to just walk away with a field goal you know, and, and kind of show your hand? Or can you count on Dylan Sherman to basically execute a second perfect onside kick and, uh, and, you know, that's what you're gambling. And, folks, quickly back down to the sideline with Spencer Pattison. Guys, there's still a chance Parish Episcopal had that onside kick earlier in this game. Can they do it again? Of course, Bel Air, they're going to be expecting this one. Let's see, guys. All right, Spencer, thank you. And here we go. The hands team in for both squads. As this is the ball game, folks, with 41 seconds to play in each team with only one timeout remaining. Dylan Sherman has the ball on the tee at the 40-yard line. In the optimal position, Jackson Renucci, a backup receiver. Oh, and they go the opposite way. Oh, and almost pulled it off. Bryson Fields just barely missed getting a finger on that football and keeping it in bounds. As the kick coming from Kyle Hamburger, you've got to love that play. Everybody looking at Dylan Sherman, and he just walks aside, and Kyle Hamburger comes from the opposite direction. Beautiful play design, and just like several plays here tonight in this ballgame, Jim just barely missing on the execution. Just, just a little bit too much. Just Hamburger with a little bit too much, too much mustard on it. Indeed, just a little bit too heavy on the mustard, and this will now give the Bel Air Episcopal Knights the opportunity to take a knee and run out the final 41 ticks of this ballgame. 
and Sin Parish to their first 0-2 defeat in several or 0-2 record following this defeat in several seasons. And we'll see if Novikov even chooses to use the timeout here as Carson Gordon taking a knee all the way back at the Episcopal 46-yard line. And Novikov just says, line it up. And both teams will allow time to expire. You know, and you, and, you know Parrish is walking out of here uh, you know, uh, uh, with a home loss uh, with two in a row. You know, and, and again, you know, you you got to credit Coach Novikov because he scheduled this stuff. Oh, yeah. He scheduled this He's not He's afraid. Not, he is not looking for a cakewalk. He no. wants these guys tested. But there has to be some result for that. Yeah. And if it's, if it's a learning, uh, a learning process, if it's uh, an opportunity for these guys to kind of broaden their reach, you know, whatever the outcome is, they're, you know, they really have to, uh, have to walk out of here. Okay, we took the loss. What do we get out of this? Right, you have to take this loss here tonight at Snyder Stadium in the home opener and turn it into a learning experience. So that way you can use what you've learned here both offensively and defensively in these first two games of the season and take that and turn it into something positive for next Friday night's game here against Austin LBJ. That game will be right here next Friday night at Snyder Stadium. Yeah, I'm, and, and, and it, you know, more positives. I mean, you know, okay, what did you get out of it? What did you learn? Well, they got to determine that in film. They got to determine that in meetings. But you have, I mean, you have had a couple little dings here and there. No real decisive injuries. And, and that's what we talked about last year. Hey, it's murderer's row. If you walk out of this thing alive, you're okay. You know, they, 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 they ripped off a four and one run, uh, did a great job, built the momentum heading on into conference play in the playoffs. And, you know, the, the whole thing is how are we gearing up to move on to the next stage of this season? Indeed, and that next stage will come next Friday night, folks, as the horn sounds ending tonight's game here at Snyder Stadium. Folks, our game complete here tonight from Parish Episcopal School in Farmers Branch, Texas, and your final score here from the Blue Turf at Parish Episcopal. Episcopal School of Houston Knights, 27. Your Parish Panthers, 20. And as the night football team gathers to get some pictures on the scoreboard with the scoreboard, Coach Novikov will talk it over with his squad as we go into the postgame show here. And, Jim, as we had mentioned earlier, Parrish now for the first time in several seasons, 0-2 to start the season. A very tough loss last week at Alito and a tough loss here tonight. The, the difference is, though, Parrish was in a learning curve last Friday night in Alito, And here tonight, it looked like they had several things worked out but there were just too many key plays where the execution just wasn't quite there. You could see the brilliance. They just couldn't quite make it happen. Well, that and, uh, you know, that couple with timely errors uh, really just kind of came back to haunt them. Um, I mean, they had, they had opportunity. They just couldn't close the deal. And that's one of those things that comes, you know, that, that comes with maturity and, and football IQ. You know, you, you got to know the situation and know, okay, I, I have to execute. And I think they got to get, they got to stop thinking about what could go wrong and they got to think about what's going to, what, what will go right. Well, speaking of what did go right this evening, the Panthers with 475 yards of offense this evening here at Snyder Stadium, 26 first downs. Of that 475 yards total offense, 320 passing, 155 rushing. As Sawyer Anderson on the evening, 18 for 38 for 320 yards and two touchdowns, but critically three interceptions on the evening. And, folks, while we have a moment, let's go down to the field with Spencer Pattison and our player of the game. Hutch Crow with me, 218 yards and a touchdown. Hutch, how'd you feel about your your performance here tonight? Um, well, we lost, so I'm pretty disappointed. Um, obviously, I could have done more. 
got a little banged up, so I wasn't able to play it at 100 percent. You know, I think I think if I'm able to play it at 100 percent, we win this game. Obviously, it's a team sport, but I think I have a big role in this team, and I didn't step up in the fourth when I should have. So you got LBJ Austin next week. That's where you're headed. Uh, what what's your thoughts there uh, as you play them at home next week? Uh, just flush the last two games. You know, we're gonna we got Labor Day, but we're gonna practice that morning, and we're just gonna we're gonna flush the rest of the games and start start over. Hutch, thank you, thank guys. And thank you, Spencer, for the interview with Hutch Crow, our player of the game. As you heard Spencer tell you, ladies and gentlemen, another outstanding effort in the loss for Hutch Crow. Ten receptions, 224 yards and a touchdown. And I know that uh, he doesn't want to take the credit there, as you heard in the in his postgame comments, Jim. But Hutch Crow is definitely playing some great football here for Parrish, as we're seeing also from on the defensive side from Caleb Bowers and a couple of other folks, and now these team leaders, these seniors, it will be up to them to help spread this learning experience and have these younger players step up for next week's game against Austin LBJ. Yeah, and, and, and the leadership on this team, uh, you know, it, it's it's not broad – it, this isn't last year's team. It's no. not it, – it's not you, – you can't point to every every kid on the offense and go – you know that kid's going to deliver us, or, or or the 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 eleven kids on defense, and, and say, okay, I, I don't have to worry about that. Right. Um, really, you need to start finding, you know, finding traction where small contributors can step into big roles, and we've seen that. We've seen that, you know, with a, with a you know a couple of you know uh, Sanford, he he had an opportunity, and um, you know. He took advantage of it. He did you know, indeed. And you need to find, you need to find twenty, you know, nineteen of those opportunities. Right. Indeed, and some more statistics here for you, as we said earlier, Car- or Sawyer Anderson, eighteen of thirty-eight for three hundred and twenty yards, two scores, three critical picks. That puts Anderson up to five interceptions on the year. He had a seven in all of last season, and as we were worried about in the beginning of this game, Carson Gordon, the dru- the dual threat quarterback. From the air, in the air, 13 of 20 for 240 yards, no touchdowns, but on the ground, 16 carries for 130 yards and two scores. So the quarterback for Bel Air Episcopal tonight, 370 all-purpose yards and two scores. Yeah, and he's a more polished product than he was last season. Very much. Um, he he's 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 matured. The fact that uh, the fact that he has Thomas in his backfield. And that kid is that kid's very good. He is and, indeed, and, and it offers an awful lot of things for that op- for that offense. But uh, you know the the thing that the thing that you know is kind of kind of out there is the way that uh, that Bel Air's uh, defense played, and they and they they. Well, they, yeah, you've got to give Bel Air credit. They make yeah. two goal line stops on the Panthers inside the five yard line and block a field goal. Yeah, and I mean, and they forced. They forced the rhythm out of Parrish's uh, game plan. And, you know, when you could do that, that's a lot. Indeed. And more statistics here in the game. Maddox Reed, 14 carries for 97 yards. Sawyer Anderson, 10 carries for 34 yards. And as you pointed out, Jim, late in the fourth quarter, Jackson Sanford in the game, four carries for 26 yards of his own. Uh, more receiving here. Logan Barbie, two catches for 88 yards for Bel Air Episcopal. Carson Fowler, two for 23. And a big rushing effort for Brandon Thomas. Not only did Carson Gordon have 16 carries for 130 yards tonight, but Brandon Thomas, 21 carries for 117 yards. So something that Coach Galusha and his squad will want to work on is they have two 100-yard rushers tonight in the loss here at Snyder Stadium. Yeah, I mean, and there's contributors. You just you, you need to find more, and you need to you need to really ring out the opportunities for these guys, and I know this coaching staff will do it. They're they're gonna they're gonna look at game film. They're gonna look at where where there's opportunities, and they're gonna coach these kids up and get them to fill those opportunities and prepare for for that you know that conference ahead and what's gonna happen down on into the playoffs. Indeed, getting this team ready for Taps play starting the first week of October is the critical mission, as these first five games are a warm-up to that, and as you alluded to earlier, Jim, a murderer's row of games 
that parish last year's parish team was able to handle with a four and one record. The only loss coming on that last second field goal to South Oak Cliff, but things a little bit different this season as they start 0-2 following the 27-20 defeat here tonight to Bel Air Episcopal. And while we have a moment, let's go back down to the field for final thoughts with our sideline reporter, Spencer Pattison. Guys, they really, uh, Parish Episcopal really struggled with uh, turnovers tonight, and along with that, there was an injury, riddled defense, offense, just about everything. Um, really, really tough game tonight. Uh, it was against a really tough opponent, uh, one of the toughest opponents in all of private school football. And it's going to be really interesting to see how they bounce back next week. They are not where they want to be, and that is what head coach Daniel Novikov said in the huddle at the very end of the game. That's not where they want to be. They want to be bigger and better every week, and that will start next week against LBJ Austin. Brian? Thank you, Spencer. And, uh, Jim, your final thoughts here is now the Parish Panthers 0-2 for the first time ever in 17 years as a football program. They get off to an 0-2 start here following the defeat to Episcopal School of Houston. Well, I mean, you can't get, you can't get down. You, you got you to gotta regroup. You got to figure out, okay, what, what do we need to augment the, our, our offense with? What do we need to augment our defense with? Who can step up? Where, if I afford somebody an opportunity, are they going to take advantage of it? What have these kids done in the off season? Are they prepared for that? Because that's the worst thing you want to do is is heap an opportunity onto a young player, and 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 know where you know that you're setting him up for failure. Right, you never what, want to do that. Right, and what Coach Novikov wants to do is find opportunities and address you know address these opportunities with kids that he knows can fill, and you know and and you're going to start building momentum from that point. Indeed, and. That momentum will need to carry forward and begin next week as right here at Snyder Stadium next week on Game On Sports we will have week three action with the Parish Panthers as they will host the Austin LBJ Jaguars. And they were able to handle the Jaguars last year, Jim, a thorough defeat 30 or 44-14 at Nelson Field in Austin. But this team now, we talked about it last week, in uncharted territory following the 50-35 to 35 defeat to Alito. Uh, that was the worst defeat in the coaching career of Daniel Novikov in his seven years here at Parrish. And now, following tonight's loss, 27-20, to Episcopal School of Houston, the Parrish Panthers, for the first time in the history of their football program, 0-2. Yeah, I mean, I don't think Novikov is looking at the margin. I mean, I, I think he's just looking at wins and losses and, and how those wins came about and how those losses came about. He's got to get on the winning side. But he needs to he needs to look at uh, you know okay look at what happened in Alito was that successful or not look at what happened on this field was that successful or not what is successful what can we draw out and that's where uh, that's where he comes into play I mean and it's you know last season it was kind of it fell on the weight room it fell on the off season this season it's really going to it's going to fall on these coaches to kind of get these guys on their feet where they can lead. Indeed, and we'll need, a, we'll need to see who steps up as they do have leaders on this team. Hopefully we'll see Caleb Mitchell Irving back next week against Austin LBJ healed from that ankle injury. And we know that that young man could lead. We saw him lead here from the sideline tonight as he was motivating that defense and trying to spur them on because we did see good things on both sides of the football tonight. The defense was showing signs of really gelling and doing some great things because this could have easily been 35 points in the first half for Episcopal School of Houston, but they were able to make stops, force them into field goal attempts rather than let them score touchdowns. So there were bright spots here tonight, both offensively and defensively, just those tiny little, you know, that half second, that pass a yard too long those little tiny things that they can work on next week and button those things up and and turn this thing around. It was right on the cusp of, you know, we saw it right there going into halftime. Parrish had an opportunity to take a 14-13 lead going into the half. They get stuffed inside the five-yard line, and then they come out with the opening drive of the third quarter, and that could have been an opportunity to make it 21-13, but instead they get zero points before halftime, and have to settle for only three points on the opening drive of the third quarter. And that was a big momentum shift in the direction of Episcopal School of Houston. 
Well, and and, and to spend a, a to spend an onside kick to generate three points on a field goal, um, not really what you want to do. Particularly when you when you put that together, that's a big momentum boost. That yes. should, I mean that that's got to be worth twenty yards right there. Just just because because guys are fired up and and want to execute. Um, you know, they just need to they need to clean up. They need to get to the execution por- portion of the thing. They need to address what's good and what's bad and get rid of the bad and build on the good. And they will do that next week as they will be hosting the Austin LBJ Jaguars right here at Snyder Stadium. Well, folks, before we say good night this evening, we'd like to take a moment and thank everyone who made this broadcast possible for you this evening. The executive producer of Game on Sports is Fred Garner. Game on Sports operations manager is Trevor Von Dahm. Tonight's Parish Panther football game was produced and directed by Ori Holman. The sights and sounds of tonight's broadcast were brought to you by our outstanding camera crew, Josiah Johnson, Tyler Presley, and Zach Sanders. Also, a special thanks to our support crew back at the home office, Lisa Carrillo, Mallory Green, and Sarah Beasley. Folks, don't forget to join us on Game on Sports Network next Friday night, September 8th, as your Parish Panthers continue their homestand here at Gloria Snyder Stadium, hosting the Austin LBJ Jaguars. Our pregame show will start next Friday right here on Game on Sports at 6.20 p.m. with kickoff scheduled for 7 p.m. Tonight's Parish Panther football broadcast is a copyrighted production of Game on Sports Network and the Parish Episcopal School. Copyright 2023, all rights reserved. Any rebroadcast, reproduction, or other use of the pictures and accounts of this broadcast without the express consent of Game on Sports Network and the Parish Episcopal School is strictly prohibited. Well, that wraps it up for us tonight here at Gloria H. Snyder Stadium. We thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for spending your Friday night with us, and we look forward to seeing you next Friday evening right here on Game on Sports. So until then, on behalf of our sideline reporter, Spencer Pattison, my broadcast partner, Jim Dixon, and our entire Game on Sports production crew, this is Brian Shackelford thanking you for joining us this evening and for your continued support of Parish Panther football. Until next week, good night and God bless from Farmers Branch, Texas.